Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. This is episode 21 of the podcast, and on today's episode, we're going to be going through next season's breakout player candidates. So really excited to get into this one today. Um, going to start at the podcast as we always do. How you doing today, Dane? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about these young up-and-coming players, man. So let's. I'm ready to get into it. For sure. And before I get too far into it, for those of y'all that are watching on YouTube, you're probably like, why the heck is this guy wearing sunglasses? <laughs> um, I did scratch my eye up earlier this week, so it's all red. The, you know, the brightness is making it painful. So I got the shades on. We're looking cool. We're looking clean. I'm about but... to say, you look cool. You look <laughs> like calm, collected. You know what I'm saying? Like, you mean business out here. Right. So, look, got, got to keep it on to make sure that the, the brightness ain't messing with my eyes. But we're fighting through it. We're bringing you the podcast. So appreciate y'all for, for tuning in, as always. Um, going to go ahead and get the typical housekeeping out the way. If you are again on YouTube, um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Um, if you are listening on audio platforms, be sure to drop us, be sure to drop us a review. Um, leave a five-star rating um, on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We appreciate that a ton. Um, and, to, and follow the uh, social links that you see there at the bottom. That's at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. We're posting shorts content daily on both of those platforms so we appreciate the support as always but before we get into our breakout player candidates for next season ladies and gentlemen we have secured our first sponsor for the pod and that is seat geek yes sir yes we gotta sir. give a shout out to seat geek for sponsoring the podcast if you don't know seat geek is a ticketing app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets, concerts, basketball, football, soccer, baseball, stand-up comedy, plays. I promise you they have everything, everything you want on SeatGeek. Um, and on SeatGeek, they give every single ticket a 0 out of 10 score and even put it on a color code graphic. So if it's a you know it's rated a 1, it's not a great deal. Probably should stay away from it. But if it's rated an 8 or a 9, you're going to see it in bright green. You know that you're really getting great value for your money, good bang for your buck. And that is a great deal on the ticket. For those of you that have been listening to the pod for a while, you know that I did go to Denver a few months ago and was able to go see the second round matchup between the Nuggets and the Suns. I actually got those tickets using SeatGeek. So that was before they were a sponsor. So mm-hmm. this is... As much as it is an ad, this is a product I've been using before. So I, I believe in it. I've used it. Um, and I think my, my seats were rated at 8.5. I got two tickets, but what, 15-ish rows off the court in a second round playoff match for 140 bucks. It was a great deal. So SeatGeek is definitely the place to go um, for one to get good value tickets to any live events, sporting, concerts. You name it. So, Dane, tell them about the promo code. So, listen, if you use code off the glass, you get $20 off of your first purchase. Like he said, you could buy it for basketball games, football games, concerts, wherever you want to do. Just make sure if you're going somewhere, if you're buying tickets, you use code, code off the glass for $20 off your first purchase. Right. That's all one word off the glass. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see the promo code there at the bottom. Yeah, again, shout out to SeatGeek. We're really excited to be able to, to start this sponsorship. And we, again, we only possible with y'all's support on the mm-hmm. podcast. So we appreciate it, ton. Again, shout out to SeatGeek. Again, use the promo code. It's the summertime, so no no basketball or football right now. But we know y'all concerts are going, going right. We know y'all going to concerts. Drake is on tour right now. And his tickets is crazy. <laughs> so right. You, so, right. You, right. Right. you need the discount. <laughs> so for me, off the glass in the little promo code section, get you a nice little $20 discount. Um, on anything, anything that you're going to on SeatGeek. So be sure. And if you're, you know, if you need to, the link, it's in our Instagram bio as well. We'll bring you right to SeatGeek. So um, be sure to download the app. And for, again, for any of your ticketing needs, use app, or use code off the glass and that'll get you the discount. Um, so shout out to SeatGeek again. Without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into our breakout player candidates for next season. Um, I think I have... Nine, nine or ten guys. Actually, probably like eleven. I kind of grouped them together. <laughs> um, it's just so much young talent that, like, I think, <clears throat> in such a good position for next season right. to really take off. And again, these are when we say breakout players. These are 
can fit into a couple of different categories. We're talking about guys who could maybe take that leap from all star to superstar level. We're talking mm-hmm. about guys who could go from you know they were good players to becoming legitimate all star. We're talking about guys who were role players who could like take a leap to becoming borderline or an actual all star. So or all star guys who are taking their role and expanding it um, big time from last season going into next season. Um, so I know I've got a pretty big list. Um, you want to go ahead and throw out your, your first player, and we'll just go ahead and dive into it that way. All right, listen. Like you said, these can be players going from all-star to superstar, you know, role player to good player, you know what I'm saying? So this first guy, listen, I'm just going to start it off big because I have full confidence in this guy, 100% confidence in this guy, and that's Anthony Edwards, man. Like, mm. he's already – people could already say he's a superstar. But I feel like superstar to me is like top 10 to 12 player, like confirmed 100%. Like you're at the top of the league as one of those best players in the NBA. And I don't think he's reached that yet, but I think this next season he will. I, th- I Honestly, I don't like making too many guarantees, but I guarantee you, Anthony Edwards, if they fully give him the keys to say this is your team, he will be in that superstar conversation basically. So he's already an all-star in his third year in the NBA. He's already an all-star. Um, he's had improvements in every single like major statistical category since like every single year he's been in the league. That's points, that's uh, uh, rebounds, that's assists, field goal percentage, three point percentage. Every single year he's been in the league, it's going up. And honestly, you could just tell by this guy's just like his, his demeanor, the way he uh, goes at the game, the way he talks about the game. It's like this guy wants to be a superstar. Like he wants to be like the best player in the NBA. Um, you could tell by the way he attacks on defense. Because I think you brought it up before. He's he's Right now, he's becoming an underrated defender, really. Mm-hmm. And he goes out there, and he wants to guard the other team's best player. He wants that best player to guard him. Like, he wants to go at you. He wants to take on that defensive assignment and then also go at you on the offensive end. And we've seen it in this past playoffs, you know what I mean? We just saw Bruce Brown in an interview. He said the Timberwolves were their hardest opponent. That's what he said. And he said mainly it was because of Anthony Edwards. He was going out there, and he was killing them. He was killing them. So I just think that Anthony Edwards has that has that the attitude, has that motor, has that want to be in that superstar level, being that like best player in the league conversation. And I think he could do that next year. Um if they've been talking about trade rumors with Carl Anthony Towns, so I don't know how true those are, but if he does get traded, this is fully Ant's team and it's gonna be scary. The statistics that he's gonna put up, the the just the level of play that he's going to reach if this is fully his team. And I think it could happen e- whether Cat gets traded or not. I think it's going to happen regardless because I think the organization realizes, like, all right, call Anthony Towns. If he's our one, we're not going anywhere. Anthony Edwards actually has the potential to be a best player on a championship-level team. So I think regardless, this is going to be his team. But even if Cat does get traded, that's just giving him more of the keys to the, mm-hmm. to the franchise. So, man, I just think, bro, honestly, his ceiling – it de- depends on how many games the Timberwolves win. I genuinely think he could have like that MVP level season. Like I, 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 think I agree. Yeah, I think he's capable of that easily. So, yeah, man, Anthony Edwards. Yeah, be on the lookout, man. I'm calling it right now. Anthony Edwards is the future superstar in the NBA. I like that. I like that a lot. I really do think. I've seen people discuss it previously that they think like his ceiling really could be a guy who comes out. We look back on his career. He has. MVP like had a stint a period of time where it's like he was in that top you know one to three players in the league for a good period of time like mm-hmm. you said he's got the right mentality for it uh, all the interviews that people have talked about him they're like what you see is that's really him he really mm-hmm. is has that kind of uh you know almost delusional like you said confidence right. but in a good way right. um to where he you know this kind of what you want out of your league guard um, I think, like you mentioned, his defense is definitely underrated. Um, he wants to have shoulder all the offensive load and then also go on the other side of the ball and lock up the best team player. So um, I like that a lot. I think that he really is somebody that we're going to have to look out for for next year. Uh, my first guy is somebody kind of in a, a similar similar like avenue where it's a guy who – was an all-star last season, but I think is about to take the next leap and can cement himself as potentially like one of the top four PGs in the league. Oh, I know who it and is. And just like, <laughs> he's going to be one step below that, like, 
Luca, Steph, you know, Dame tier. Mm -hmm. And that is Tyrese Halliburton. I got him too. I think that one, ob yeah, obviously with the, the injury he had last season, I think it was his elbow, um, that kind of hindered some of his momentum earlier in the season. And their, their season kind of fell apart towards the, you know, while he was out, they kind of fell down the standings. Um, but still last season put up basically 21 points a night, 10 and a half assists. I think he led the league in uh, assists per game, or he was one of the leaders in assists per game. Four rebounds, 1.6 steals um, on phenomenal efficiency. Um, shot 49% from the field, 40% from three, 87% from the free throw line. So he's a legitimate 50, 40, 90 candidate. And when you think about this Pacers team now, also, again, what the biggest hole in their roster last year was they just didn't really have a, a guy at the four. They had a couple of different people that they rotated through. They tried Jalen Smith and they had O'Shea Brissett there for a little bit. They just never really had a solidified guy because the rest of their roster was pretty much set out. Um, and they bring in Obi Toppin, who they got for basically nothing from New York. I think that that is like mm, chef's kiss, perfect fit um, for what that roster has. They also bring in Bruce Brown. And so now you're looking at, you know, Tyrese with a, you know, going into year three, Benedict Matherin. Um, and then you have Bruce Brown, Obi Toppin, and Miles Turner. You've got great spacing, great shooting, versatile bigs. you got Obi Toppin who can pick and pop, you know, roll, short roll, backdoor cut great um, from the, the wing or the corner. Same thing with Miles Turner. Obviously, you know what he can do as a shooter, as a big. Um, and Benedict Matherin, who, again, you know, very versatile off-ball guard. Like, the way that this roster is constructed, like, he really can like take his game to a level where he's putting up like 24 night 11 12 assists like yeah. put crazy crazy numbers and if their team success gets up like i think they're probably a lock for the playoffs in the east mm -hmm. and like if they can push that a little bit further like whatever the five seed the four seed right like and he's the best player on that team like not only is he going to be an all-star but like we have to start having that conversation about Tyrese Halliburton being one of the best point guards in the league. And then from even just a passing perspective, like one of the best passers in the league already, but that's only going to get amplified with the, the team success. So yeah, Tyrese Halliburton is somebody that I have here as somebody who I think, again, being an all-star last year is about to take that leap into like solidifying himself as one of the best players in the league at their position. Um, I think he has a, a for real chance to, like, be a top four point guard, like, across the league and, like, really just be on the heels of that tier that's, like I said earlier, Steph, Luka, um, and Dame. So you get into the mix with guys, like, you know, who are right outside of that, guys like Trey Young. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm expecting a big season um, from Tyrese Halliburton next year. Yeah, I, he's one of my players, too. I had him on the list as well because, mm -hmm. like, for all the reasons that you said, it's just they added so many quality players around him, and they already had a lot of quality players around him, a lot of spacing, a lot of athletic players as far as that Obi Toppin addition as well. So just him already averaging 10 assists per game, that's only going to go up, I feel like. Plus, mm -hmm. you can have a added scoring just with his development and stuff like that. So for his ceiling, I say he could be an all-NBA caliber player. And one thing I did put in here is, like, with Chris Paul getting older – I think Tyrese Her Tyrese Halliburton could be that new point god, like mm -hmm. yep. of like this modern day NBA. You know what I mean? I think he could take over like that role. When you think of like best point guards in the league, people who elevate the players around you, people who just you add him to a team and he's gonna make them better and he's gonna make all the players around him better. He's gonna facilitate, run the offense. Like like you said, be be the point god basically. I think he could take over that basically. So yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I'm 100% agree with everything you said. So. Um, I'm gonna just uh, this guy wasn't next, but since we're already talking about Tyrese Halliburton, my next breakout candidate actually was Obi Toppin. So yeah, talk <laughs> about it. Talk about so, it. So <clears throat> excuse me, like we everything we just talked about. I just feel like adding an athletic player as good as he is in an offense where you have one Tyrese Halliburton running the show. Basically, he's gonna set you up. The lobs are gonna be insane. The fast mm -hmm. breaks are gonna be insane. The pace of play is gonna be insane. All that fits into what Obi Toppin is, is, is doing. You know what I mean? So that, along with the fact that they have so much spacing over there in Indiana, like, 
a lot of those guys can space the floor as, lo as well as doing other things well, but they're really good shooters. So, like, he's just going to fit into that system and fit into that team just perfect off the rip. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I, I feel like he showed flashes when he was in New York. It, it was obviously just the fact that Julius Randle was starting over him, so he couldn't really get the run, couldn't really get the minutes that he probably deserved, honestly, because his per 36 stats, I think they were, they were solid. I think it was, like, I, 17... I, yeah. It was like 17 and 7, something like that. So, I mean, yep. I, I'm not saying he's going to be like an all-star. I'm not saying he's going to be, you know, a superstar in the league. But just to go from a role player who wasn't really getting much minutes in the NBA going to this Pacers team, I think he can be a solid, solid, well above average starter in the NBA going to this Pacers team. So his ceiling, um, I said he honestly could be a most improved candidate, most improved player of the year candidate. 100%. Just because... Going, like we said, going from what he what he did with the Knicks and then coming to this team, I think his numbers will obviously be a whole lot better. And then we talked about Indiana. I think they're a playoff lock as well. I think they're going to be winning some games. I think Tyrese is going to take that step, and that's just going to elevate everybody and get more attention on this Indiana Pacers team. Yeah, like he got 15.7 minutes per game last season. That's easily going up to, like, what, minimally like, like 26, 20, 28. I was about to say like 25, yeah, right. minimum 25. So he jumps up and his career. I'm looking like even his counting stats from last year, like he put up seven and three. Like he just did not have the minutes yeah. to do. And we saw in games where he did play, he would have a huge impact. And so you already mentioned his per 36 numbers. Like if he can get around that, you know, 15, 17 points a game, seven, eight rebounds a night, a couple of assists, you might get him up to like maybe a block, um, a steal. Like mm -hmm. definitely like almost doubling your points per game, doubling your rebounds, like most improved candidate for sure. Um, speaking of most improved, I'm actually going to bring up a guy who I think is my, I don't know if he's my pick for most improved player. I really have to sit down and think about it, but he's definitely like, a, I would say a dark horse for the award because the greater NBA fan does not not, especially last season, did not watch a lot of Spurs basketball, and I think this guy is criminally underrated, to be honest with you. Um, but, it's again, it's just San Antonio market, and then team was taken, so not a lot of national mm -hmm. media coverage. But Devin Vassell is somebody who I think can really – has a legitimate case to win the Most Improved Player of the Year award. Um, I think he's going to benefit – greatly from playing with Wemby, obviously night in night out that's going to be the story well you know everything is going to be focused around him teams are going to put their focus around him defensively that's only going to create even more opportunities for him um pulled up some stats from him on uh was it b-ball index um who, who rank players through percentiles and grades um so in terms of three-point percentage, he's in the 80th percentile last year. If you look at that just in terms of corner and catch-and-shoot threes, he was in the 85th percentile in uh, NBA players and three-point percentage from the corner, shooting almost 48% there. Catch-and-shoot threes, he's in the 89th percentile, shooting a little bit over 43% on catch-and-shoot threes. Um, and then when we look at his three-point shot-making and shot creation, um, he was in the 90th percentile in three-point shot making and in the 84th percentile in three-point shot creation. So not only is he a guy um, who excels on the perimeter in terms of being a spot-up guy, catch-and-shoot guy, he's got the step back. He's got you know tools in his bag to be able to create for himself. Like I said, being able to play with Wemby, we're probably going to see some options there where um, you know he's running some pin downs to get open. He's going to probably be running some on-ball screen actions with Wembenyama which, again, seems like it's going to be nightmares because, like, he can roll, he can pick and pop. you got a guy who can handle the ball and create for himself on the perimeter and is lethal from three and Devin Vassell. So um, I think that he is primed to have a really, really good season there in San Antonio. Um, last year he put up, you know, 18.5 points per game um, and, and four rebounds as well and four assists almost and a steal, um, again, shooting – Oh, basically 39% from three, 44% from the field. Um, so I think we could see those numbers potentially jump up into the 20s. Um, and again, with some additional team success there in San Antonio, he brings that, you know, at three point percentage up into the 40s. Um, you know, who knows? And I, there have been rumblings in the past about 
them potentially wanting to move on from Keldon Johnson, and that will kind of even open up, you know, even more offensive opportunity for both him and Wemby. And I think Devin Vassell legitimately could be the second option there in San Antonio. Um, so I think he's a guy that is going to have a really, really good breakout year. Um, and I think the added eyes that Wemby is going to have, he's going to steal some of that that show there and steal some people's attention because he's a guy that is a legitimate hooper. Um, he's been doing this since he came into the league out of Florida state. Um, and yeah, I think he's going to, he's going to put up good numbers next year. I like how you said that, like when the added attention from Wimby is going to translate to him. Cause that is true. Cause I, like I said, I'm never going to lie. I didn't watch barely any San Antonio games. Mm-hmm. I, like I said, I don't really like watching tanking teams, but no, that's definitely somebody you got to keep your eye out for. Like you said, the added attention, He's definitely going to steal some of that. So I definitely, I could see that for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, my next candidate, um, <laughs> he's one of, he's my guy. And you know what I'm saying? I like this guy. I really do like this guy, genuinely. And, you know, he's been going through a lot this this last year, this off season. Recently, he's been going through a lot, you know what I mean? But I think he's going to come out this season. I think he's going to ball. And that is my guy, Draymond Green sparring partner, Jordan Poole. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I genuinely, all right, all jokes aside, I do think he's going to have a really good year, though. I genuinely mm-hmm. think he's going to have a really good he year. Was, he's on my list, too. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. But I think with the Wizards, um, you're going from a team that had, obviously, Steph, Clay, Draymond, Wiggins. Like, you're going from a team that had a lot of mouths to feed, basically a lot of, like, you were low, lower on the, 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 the shot chart, basically, just because, obviously, you're not the star of that team. You're just not, um, you're not the second option on that team. So you're going from a team that had a lot of miles to feed offensively to a team in the Wizards who don't really have anybody besides Kuzma. I like Tyus Jones as well. But mm. as far as being that number one scoring option, Jordan Poole can easily be that, I feel like. He can easily be that. Um, he averages 21-4-3 and three as a starter in the NBA. And we've seen a game that Steph has not played. Jordan Poole's numbers have been amazing, have been fantastic. Like His scoring has been great um, every game that he's played and Curry has not. So... We've already seen before that when he is a starter that he's going to put up good scoring numbers. Um, not saying it's going to translate to winning because that we don't know for sure. But yeah. just as far as like just stats, as far as um, him being a first option on this team, I think that he'll put up great numbers. And the fact that this team is not really trying to win right now. So he's really going to be able to shoot whatever he wants. Like he's going to get the green light over there because, like I said, they're not trying to win right now. They have no pressure to win. It's not like in Golden State where it's like, all right, that bad shot, we can't have that come sit on the bench. You know what I mean? We're trying to, we're playing for something or we're in the playoffs right now. You're costing us the game. It's like, there's going to be a lot of mistakes, there's, but there also is going to be a lot of flashy plays. There's going to be a lot of highlight plays. There's going to be a lot of big games. There's going to be probably going to be a lot of like high turnover games. I mean, honestly, there's probably going to be nights where he goes out there, he has seven turnovers. But mm-hmm. I just feel like throughout the course of the season that he's going to, his game is really going to be able to improve and develop just because he's going to have the green light over there. And he's art. We've already seen he has the tools to be a great scorer in the NBA. Um, and I think he's a pretty good passer as well. So it's not like he's just going to be out there chucking shots. So yeah. I think leaving Golden State, going to the Wizards with a fresh start, hopefully this Draymond stuff can really like go to the side. It's probably never really going to go away because um, when they play each other, you know, it's probably going to get brought back up again or something like that. But yeah. just as far as games throughout the regular season where nobody's really talking about that Draymond and him and all that situation, I feel like he's going to really – he's going to benefit from that, that, that fresh start in going to Washington. So I think he's a player that – I don't know if he can make the all-star team, but I think he could put up all-star level numbers. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I think he's going to be able to put up stats that are equivalent to people who are on the all-star team. So I did that, and potentially it's tough because there's a lot of guys in the league that are really, really good scorers. I originally put, like, I didn't, I'm not, I don't feel like he's going to lead the league in scoring, but I feel like he's going to be up there as far as if he really reaches his full potential, he can be around, like, 27 28 depending on just how how much of the green light he really gets so <laughs> yeah yeah he, he could be up there so i think it's gonna be a really good season for jordan Poole. yeah like you said there is very little expectation this season for them to do anything in terms of meaningful winning basketball mm-hmm. so the green light should be there for him not a ton of mouths to feed like you said um I think, like you mentioned, it'll be tough for him to make the all-star game, and a lot of that is probably going to be due to just, like, team success. Like, Right, they're not going to win I don't even – this is not even a playing team, I don't think. So, they – it's going to be tough for them to even get an all-star. He'd have to be putting up 
crazy numbers to make the All Star game. He's, this is um, probably gonna be the worst team in the league, if I'm being honest. Like drug wise, yeah, they're probably gonna be the worst. They got, team a, the they got a shot, um, but yeah, I think just with the added freedom, I think getting out of that situation in Golden State, like he was on my list basically for all the same reasons, like you mentioned. I think that he's gonna have. It's just the the ultimate green light. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And he's a guy like we've seen in the past. Like if he gets hot, a couple of shots fall from him. It's like it could be an avalanche real quick. It could be a pool party real quick. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so you know they get a couple. Feel me, Daddy's courtside in Washington. He might go <laughs> off for forty, fifty, whatever. So, um, but no, for real, I think that um, he's somebody that's going to be primed for a, a big, big time season next year. Um, and you brought him up earlier. I have him on my list. His teammate. Tyus Jones is somebody that I have as a breakout candidate. Now, I don't know okay. exactly what his ceiling is, um, but he's led the NBA in assist to turnover ratio every single season since 2019, which that's a crazy stat. Like, that's a wild stat. Bro, four years in a row. Or this is what, 2019, 2021? 20, yeah, five seasons in a row. That's crazy. You've led the NBA in assist to turnover ratio. And I'm like clicking through it right now. It's the first in 2019, it was seven, then 5.2, 5.5, And it's crazy because his brother came in second that year as a backup in San Antonio. And then last season, him and him and Monty Morris tied at 5.4 um, assist to turnover per game or based on their, their season totals. So it's like this is a guy who does the very, very like the core basics of what you want your point guard to do at like the most elite level. He protects the ball and he like he gets offense moving and right. gets scores in a position to finish. Um, which is like if that's all your point guard is giving you, like great, like that is great. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, and so for, a, I think, a long time, when he took this last deal with Memphis, I was kind of surprised because, again, he had already led the league in assist to turnover ratio a couple of times at that point. So I think he's been a starting level point guard in this league for some time. And um, I think he obviously wanted to go back to Memphis because he saw what that team was able to put together and wanted to you know make a legit push there. Obviously, that didn't pan out these last two years with the injuries in this past season with some of the off-the-court stuff with Ja there. But... Um, now he's getting opportunity, like we said, in Washington, where expectations are much lower. They're not going to be a playoff team, most likely, like they were the whatever two seed in the West um, this past year. Um, he's getting that starting opportunity to where, uh, you know, this last season he's getting, what, 24 minutes a night. He's uh, going to jump up into the 30s in Washington, most likely. Um, he's going to have a lot of games where he's playing 35-plus minutes. Um and if he can just keep that ratio relatively close, like it might be harder to do, obviously, with just more time on the ball. There's just more likelihood that you're going to eventually have to turn the ball over. But even just like flat out, like a, a five assist to turnover ratio is great. Like that is elite in terms of ball security. So um, I could easily, easily see him being a guy who's averaging a double double, like putting up, you know, 15 points. 10 or you know 10 plus assists um there in washington um so i think he's gonna cement himself as like almost like in that mid tier of point guards like and, and like starting point guards across the league like he's mm -hmm. not gonna be in the top top echelon of guys but he's gonna end up being a guy who's like most teams would love to have tyus jones on their roster um 100 and so I think he could easily come in and Washington and cement himself as like somewhere around a top 15, maybe 10 point guard in the league. Um, and look, he's going to be, could be a big reason why Jordan Poole ends up putting up whatever, 25, 26 a night, right. um, you know, with his passing and his playmaking ability. So I like Tyus Jones a lot. I think that he's somebody who is about to come into next season and really cement himself as like, not only am I, like, obviously good enough to be a starting point guard in the NBA, but, like, I'm a well above the average starting point guard. Like, I am a very good starting point guard. So um, I'm expecting a, a big year from him next year.
That's what, I was a little um I was a little a little sad that he didn't go to a, a contending team you know yeah because I, mean? I do feel like he's one of those guys where like you said he will have a, a good season with the Wizards but I just think like you you said it a lot of teams would love to have Tyus Jones on their team a lot of winning teams a lot of right. contending teams would love to have Tyus Jones but 100 percent I definitely I definitely see where you're coming from now um the this <laughs> this next guy can count for like three or four different guys because uh, all these guys are lumped up together basically so um my next guy is Jalen Green mm. I just think that <laughs> and we're probably gonna have a lot of rockets on these lists <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because bro all, all these guys can break out and it's gonna be exciting to see which ones actually take that step <laughs> somebody has to take the step there. <laughs> somebody has to do it bro it's it's only right somebody has to do it so um I think it's gonna be Jalen Green um I think that he already has the tools to be a star level player in the NBA. We've seen flashes plenty and plenty of times. I just think that the fact that they were such a bad team with no structure that it was hard for him to to really show to really showcase what he can do as far as like playing winning basketball, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. He was going out there. He was putting up decent numbers, not too efficient, but he was going out there and putting decent numbers. But they looked like an AAU team out there. Like they looked like a team that had no structure, no nobody leading them, nothing. So now you add veterans to this team as far as Fred Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks, Jeff Green off the bench, who's probably not going to play, but just that veteran leadership in the locker room is going to do wonders for him. Um, that championship level experience, and then you add Emil Doka, who's going to try to get these guys to buy it on the defensive end, and even if. I'm not saying they're going to all become elite level defenders, but just the fact that you're going to have a coach out there who's been in the finals, who's coached superstars, who knows what it takes, who can at least show you what it takes to get to that level. I think that's going to be huge for his game. And yeah, I just think he's, like I said, he's already shown the flashes. So the fact that you give him a team that has structure, um, that has direction, and is not just trying to lose, I think he'll put up great numbers. And I think his, I think he could be an all-star level player. The efficiency, I think, is also going to jump up for him, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, like, having the structure and having this increased talent around him, and now you've got some vets there as well. Like, the efficiency is going to come. I, I never like people that have written him off so early because it's, like, empty stats, whatever. Like, I think those are all bad arguments, especially on a team that's intentionally losing games. Right, and he's young. Um, like, right. bro, he's, he came out as what 19 20 like he was a ignite guy so like but why do people want these young players to be super of 50 40 90 like three two three years into their career like they're young like it's okay that they're inefficient bro that will come hopefully but like you can't knock young players for being inefficient they're young like you didn't even let them develop yet right and it's annoying because you get the guys who come in and they get ridiculed by fans and it's like if they never do pan out fans get to take this huge victory lap i told you so this and that but like if they do ever get to you know efficient level guy like devin booker Mm -hmm. and they'll still try to hold on and be like well okay now his team's better you know like it was empty stats when he was losing it's like bro like you you just can't win it's just a it's a bad mentality it doesn't really make sense like devin booker was bad or the Suns were bad when Devin Booker was playing well. It's no surprise that when they put a competent team around him, they went to the finals. Like, right. <laughs> it looks like empty stats because they can't win because basketball is not a 1v1 game. Like, it's about not even just the five on the court, but, like, do you have a good bench? Like, do you have good coaching? Like, is it a good scheme? Everything fit? Like, there's so many more factors that go into it. And do so you like, want this guy to not put up stats? Like, empty stats is so weird to me because it's like, if he goes out there and he sucks on a losing team, then he just sucks. Right, then he's, he's horrible. Good, right, but if he's good, it's empty stats. Like, do you not want him to at least go out there and, like, do good? Like, wh- you can't win. It's a lose-lose. Right, right. It's a, a bad mentality to, to look through the game with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my Rockets guys off now since you brought up Jalen <laughs> Green. I have two different guys here, and one of them, I'll start with Tari Easton because he falls under a lot of the reasons that you mentioned with, with bringing in Ime Udoka. Um, what he was able to do with that Celtics roster um, and getting them to really buy in on the defensive side of the ball, I was listening to uh, Grant Williams was, was on J.J. Reddick's podcast this week, and I was listening to him talk about the differences between Brad, Ime, and, and Joe Mazzulla as coaches. He said that Brad was a really great 
you know, X's and O's guy. Joe, he thought, did really well at, like, um, getting players to, like, step up and be the leaders. He said he felt that Ime was, like, the best of both worlds between the two of them, whereas, like, he would conf- – like, obviously, like, had the scheme, had the strategy, was a defensive-minded guy, but at the same time understood when he needed to, like, challenge a guy and be like, you know, he calls a timeout, something isn't working, however, they're running some type of coverage – Instead of switching the coverage, he said sometimes Ime would come into the huddle and be like, you're just not doing enough. Like, you have to be better. Like, I'm not changing anything. I don't care. He's going to cook you or you're going to do better. Like, that just is what it is. And so I think that kind of mentality going into a a locker room that is so young and scrappy, and I know they're got to be hungry because they can – they know what people are saying about them, right? Like, they know that people think that – like we just said about Jalen Green's inefficient you know empty stats whatever or bad team laughing stock of the league they're adding extra chips on their shoulder with you know Wemby, you know being happy that he didn't go to houston people kind of been taking shots at houston all off season um so they're going to come out with something to prove and i think tari eason as a defender embodies that so well and he has the opportunity to like i said get with ime and really really lock in and take his game to the next level not just on the defense side of the ball like I think that's where Ime is going to help him out the best. But he, again, is going to benefit from, okay, last year you were playing with, you know, KPJ and KJ Martin. It's like, okay, now that's Fred and Jalen Green is, you know, again, another year better. Um, you bring in Dylan Brooks as well. Al P, who is the next guy I have on my list here, um, is getting better and taller, <laughs> apparently, too. <laughs> um so, like, even when you just look at his summer league stats, like, I think he played, like, two or three games, like, 23 a game, almost 10 rebounds, four assists, three steals and a block in, in two or three summer league games. This is his averages. Like, I think he is going to be a for real, like, a for real lockup defender on the defense side of the ball can go and take on your best perimeter guy. Um, going to be really switchable almost one through four, like, you know, unless that, you know, four guys giving up a lot of size there, but very comfortable. I think can switch one through three um, athletic, as we saw punching it on people in, in summer league. Um, so I think the defense is going to take a huge step in that offense. If he just get takes, you know, baby steps year after year, and he gets to a point where he can, you know, very comfortably be a knockdown three point shooter can attack closeouts like doesn't need to do too much again because already have Jalen Green and Alperen and Fred there like his offensive load doesn't need to be too big or his plate that he has to to carry um but I think the defense with Ime is going to be a big big step forward for Tari Eason so I'm expecting him to take a big leap next year and show out um and then with Al P uh he went on let me make sure I got the name right. The the Brado and Will show are two two of the biggest people on Rockets Twitter. So shout out to them. Um, and they were interviewing him, and there were kind of been rumors about him getting taller over the summer. So they flat out asked him. You know, he was listed as I think six, six nine, nine. Mm-hmm. right? And he said he went back to Turkey, worked out, and everything, and he got measured. And he is now barefoot six eleven. Barefoot six eleven is crazy. Right, that so you, like seven you put foot, on shoes. Really. He's a legitimate seven footer. That's a different player. That's a whole different player. Right, because you six nine and you going against a seven footer. It's like okay, you're giving up a couple of inches in height, you know, wingspan, whatever. You put on some basketball shoes. Now you're also a legitimate seven footer. So that I think is going to make a huge difference. Um, I know I've brought it up before on the the podcast, but like. Watching Rockets games last year, I always thought that their offense looked the best when he was kind of the central engine to it, and they kind of ran a lot of the offense through him out of the high post um, and let him handle the ball a lot more. Um, When you look at his per 36 stats from last year, um, he would be putting up 18.5 points per game, 11 rebounds, and five assists uh, with over a steal and a block. and he shot 55% from the field, 33% from three, which, again, for a center, as young centers especially, like those are very solid efficiencies, um, which are probably going to grow again as his offensive role is going to shrink a little bit with the addition of some of the newer guys that they have um, and Jalen Green's growth there as well. Uh, so I think that, and I'm hopeful that 
with the addition of Fred, um, that Ime doesn't go f- far away from letting him be a central focus of their offensive motion, at least. Like, mm-hmm. let him have the post touches. Let him have the, you know, the playmaking options out of the post. I'm not saying that he needs to, you know, we need to <clears throat> set him up on the block every single play. But um, if you're Houston, what I saw last year is that allowing him to get it, you know, on the high block or the low block and be able to work from there. And he can kind of, you know, he has the finesse. He has the footwork to be able to score, to draw double teams and kick out. Um, and to be able to create offense from that position on the floor. Uh, I like that a lot. The growth spur, I think, is going to make a huge, huge difference um, in both his ability to score, um, but also, again, rebound and play defense as well. I know that I think Ime came in and he said that they wanted to bring in another big. That might change now if Al Perrin is seven foot. Legitimately, like, that's something that you can look and see. How does he perform now? If he can hold his own a little bit better on the defensive side of the ball, which is something that, Steven Silas was really critical uh, with him about last year. He can hold his own a little bit better. Like, you can legitimately just run him at the five. You have Jabari at the four, who already is an elite defender, can switch, you know, one through four, one through five in some circumstances. Like, you've got a very nice team set up when a lot of players who can be versatile on both sides of the ball. So, you mentioned Jalen Green. I think he's going to have a great year. Tari Eason and Al P are going to have, I think, great near years next year. This Rockets team as a whole, I think, is about to break out. Yeah, like, like everybody, just, bro. Everybody. They're just finally, I think, <clears throat> going to take that step forward in the right direction where it's like there's nothing to tank for anymore. Like, we've got the pieces. We consolidated some of the, the assets. We traded some of the, you know, the younger depth guys. We have a good minute rotation. We got this reigning summer league MVP now, too, and Cam Whitmore. It's like this team is young. They're deep. They got some vets there. Like, they should go out with the intention, like, let's just let's just try to make the plan. Let's try to get, like, 30, 35 wins, and let's try to make the playing game. You know what else they should try to do? They should try to win the end season tournament. Like, what do y'all have they to should. lose? Y'all they should, should try to win as many games as they, as they can. Those tournament nights, they should take it like it's the NBA Finals. You might as well. And I'm, that's the part why I'm excited, because them young teams, like, who might not make the playoffs – this could just be their playoff. Let's just play like this is like a playoff, like a playoff game. So, right. Yeah, a hundred percent. I also had Shingun. All the same reasons that you said. Like, listen, I think people think probably think we're Rockets fans on this podcast. So I feel like we're <laughs> always talking about the Rockets, but it's rightfully so because they're really building something really good over there. That's really gonna mm-hmm. be fun to watch. So, um, I didn't even have Jabari Smith on my list, but when I think about it, it's like he also is a guy. That could <laughs> he could that end up breaking team. out. Dylan Brooks might be a breakout player. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, bro. I just think Jabari Smith, just for the same reasons, the fact that e- Eme is over there, I just think defensively going to be top notch. And mm-hmm. what he showed me in in summer league really made me a believer. I'm not saying he's going to be a superstar, but who knows? You might not need to be a superstar on this team at all. Like you might just need to be. A, a a solid NBA player and that'll right. be enough to contribute to a good team over there in Houston. So I just think defensively with Ime is going to be great, and I just think the the offensive bag that he showed me in summer league, just the mm-hmm. way he was scoring. It's not the fact that he scored thirty. It's not the fact that he scored thirty eight. It's not the fact right. that he hit the game winner. It's, it was the way he did it and how he got those points. I seen talked about it before. I seen jump shooting. I seen turnaround shots. I seen I seen post work. I seen off the drill. I seen everything. He showed me everything. So, right. I, I, I'm a I'm a fan. I'm definitely a fan of his Rockets team. So yeah. all these guys, they really do have potential. All of them to break out in some way, shape, or form. So yeah. it's gonna be good to watch. I think there's a for real timeline where Jabari becomes the third option there in Houston, where it's like Jalen Green is the guy, right? He's the, the super superstar, ever you know, lead guard. Mm-hmm. And then Al Perrin could really be your like, we talked about it before, like, this baby Sabonis, baby Jokic type of prototype. But, like, legitimately, like, he could put up 19, 20 points a night, 10 rebounds, get you about six, seven assists. And, like, Jabari just becomes a third option. And it's like, if he progresses on this trajectory that he's on, like, it's a fantastic third option to have, you know? So when you have that much talent, like, and you can reduce their role to where it's like, on some nights, he really can focus on kind of being his floor space or catch and shoot guy. But like you just mentioned, he has the bag now to attack a closeout, go get in the post, work out that way. Like 
handle the ball at the same time being one of the most versatile switching young you know kind of wing defenders in the league that that is houston in general like Forget breakout players. They're a breakout team. Right? <laughs> nah, for real, for real though. For um, real. And I think I like all I like the fact that all their, their games kind of complement each other too. Like, yeah. I can't really think of nobody game no one's game who just straight up clashes to where like, all right, eventually like we're probably gonna have to get rid of this guy or something, or it's not gonna work. I think all their games complement each other well. Right. And the fact that we didn't mention I'm in Thompson one time. <laughs> right. And, and like, bro, even with the veterans they have over there, like you said, Fred is on basically a two year deal because I think third year is a team option. Team option Dylan yeah. Brooks is well, on a he's on a four year deal, but I mean it's Dylan Brooks. Who cares? So <laughs> eventually, like, even if those young guys develop with I mean Thompson, Cam Whitmore, like they can just step in and fill those roles. Yeah, and Dylan Brooks' contract is front loaded too. Um, so a large chunk oh, of the okay. money is coming out this first two years. They, like I said, it, people, okay, they did a smart thing. They were very, very uh, thorough in how they went about their free agency process. Doing the two plus one with Fred is very smart. Mm-hmm. Front loading Dylan Brooks' contract is smart because there is a world where he starts this year, maybe he starts next year, but we get to the third year of that contract. Tari, it's your spot. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's like it doesn't look like you're you're not paying him twenty five to sit on the bench. Now it's actually like. Actually, getting paid like 15, 17 because you got thirty M's in the first year. Mm-hmm. Um, so they they constructed everything well. I want to ask you if a man Thompson comes out this year, right? Has a great great rookie year playing off the bench, right? Comes out second season. We see the leaps, we see the growth. He's like we see the growth. He's doing these flashes where it's like if we could just give him the keys and be the lead guard, like this could be something for real. Um, what percentage do you think is likely that the Rockets pick up that third year option on Fred, or do you feel like it's almost a foregone conclu- foregone conclusion that you can go through the first two years, turn down the option, and turn that over to to a man? I think, hmm, I I I think it's very unlikely that they pick up that third option if everyone stays on the trajectory that they're on right now, because mm-hmm. you got to think about it. That means so let's just say Jalen Green. He takes that step. He's a young star in the league, something like that. Shangun, he takes that step. He's a young star. I'm not even saying Jabari. Like, just you just think if they reach the potential that they could reach, and then you have a man Thompson who's playing very, very well. It's like one, you're gonna have to pay Jalen Green. You're gonna have to pay all these young stars. So it's like, yeah. do I really want to put that money into into Freddie when it's like I'm gonna have to pay my young stars anyway? And Freddie's not gonna get no better. You know what I mean? It's not like he has more room to grow. Like Freddie is what he is right now. So yeah, I, I think it's a very unlikely chance that they pick up that third option especially when you have a man thompson who's gonna be breathing down his neck basically saying like yo if you give me the keys like i am the, the future point guard of this franchise i think it's very unlikely that they pick up that third option i want to also say right now that a defensive lineup with a man thompson tari eason and jabari smith all on the floor at the same time the length the switchability active hands you've got rim protection like that is scary scary. and then you're pairing that all up with the ime yudoka coach right (laughs) bro i see why i I see the vision ime because people was questioning like well why you going to the rockets i see the vision ime i see what you see i get it now i get it i get it um so yeah i i agree i just i don't think i don't think there's a world where they pick up that that third year because that's like I was like, it's high, 40, very unlikely 40 some 42 43 m's that third year is the highest year to deal um but hey it just makes sense for both sides you go got your bag fred go new team you're not going to get the same kind of deal unless you come out and hoop crazy which i, I can't imagine um but, the only uh, way I see is if if this if is if MN doesn't like develop like if he doesn't pan out really that's the only way I see it. But just he just has too many uh, too many tools to show to to he has too many tools to not break out. Is basically what I'm trying to say. Like he's just I think he's gonna be fine. So Freddie, I'm sorry, you probably not gonna get that third year with the Rockets, bro. Yeah, and you know, as I, said, I think it's the right move for everybody because yeah, it's his value will go down way worse if then that third year. Because then by then, I think you just got to give them in the keys. And it's mm-hmm. like, you got Fred getting paid 40 plus M's to be a bench player. Like, yeah, that's crazy. Bench. 
which means that next contract we are way down mm-hmm. versus if you come off of that second year where you were the starter like they're ready to turn it over you just came off of being a starter you could still probably get you a nice you know upwards 20 million dollar deal right you know, you know with the salary cap in a couple of years it might be 25 million like that might just be the going rate for um, real though so i think that that uh that'll probably be the best for all parties involved involved but i can't i can't see him staying there for the third year um Going on to the next guy that I have on my list, a little bit of a deep cut. Um, I got Double O and Yeka Kongwu um, there in Atlanta. Uh, last season put up uh, 10 points, seven rebounds, um, and almost a steal, 0.7 steals, and then 1.3 blocks a night. Um, obviously, on really good efficiency, um, you know, 60, almost 64% from the field. Um, if you look at his per 36 minutes, that jumps up to 15 points a game, 11.2 rebounds, 2.1 blocks, 1.1 steals. Um, he's a guy who I feel like for a while now, like just because of how Clint Capella is and like how he fits. A lot of teams are like, again, specifically Atlanta, where like you have a great offensive engine and he could very easily like, Screen set, roll, sit in the dunker spot, be a lob threat, um, and then just be a rim protector on the other side of the ball. Like he fits exactly what Atlanta is trying to do. Uh, but I think Anyeka is where they're trying to go um, as their their center long term. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, he he is giving up a good bit of height. I think he's six eight without shoes, so we're looking at you know, six nine, maybe six ten with shoes at best. Uh, so he's given up some height there, but you know what I see from him in his play, uh, both on the glass, like athletic, has good feel for for rebounding the ball, and then defensively, like the rim protection is real. It's real with Double O, um, and you know that's both as a you know kind of post up face up defender, like challenging shots that way, also coming over as a weak side guy and, and protecting the rim. So. He has the, I think, the natural defensive instincts. Um, the size is, I think, it's always going to be tough, um, and I think that's something that we'll, we'll see this year. I imagine they'll probably bump up his minutes a little bit, um, and if he can kind of last in a longer term minute setting where you know, they feel comfortable playing him as the the one big on the court, and he could hold his own that way. It would not surprise me if they move off of Clint Capella this year, maybe at the trade deadline. Um, and kind of turn that over to to Anyeka. And I think he is a guy who will pair nicely with the other guy I have here from the Hawks, with his, which is Jalen Johnson, who I think is going to gonna probably be starting in place of John Collins now that they've finally uh, moved off of him mm-hmm. after being in trade talks for so many years. Right. Um, he's a uh, super athletic um, again, didn't get a ton of run last season. When he did, he had the flashes. Um, the shooting still needs to get better. I think he shot 28% from three last year. Um, so that will have to continue to improve. But again, the flashes in terms of um, his athleticism, his ability to, to roll to the rim, um, his feel kind of playing as a, a four there. Um, he's 6'9". So I think the two of them playing together, like, both are giving up a little bit of size for bigs, but both of them have really great defensive instincts. Both of them are super athletic, great help side defenders. So in terms of helping the helper, both of them, you know, kind of working together to kind of protect the rim. Mm-hmm. I really like that. Um, and then what that also does is it allows Atlanta to really bump up the pace of their offense even higher because you're going to take slower guy like Clint, replace him with Anyeka. You bring in Jalen Johnson as well, who can play fast like John Collins can. And it's like we can be ripping and running, like space, get, yeah. get to stop on the defense side of the ball. We're kicking it up to Trey, kicking it over to Dejounte. You got shooters coming down the court. You got Anyeka and Jalen Johnson running, filling the paint, looking for lobs. And it's like this transition that the Hawks have, the, their, like their transition offense, uh, I think can be really, really lethal this upcoming season. So I got the two of them both on this list. I think both of them are going to be primed to to really expand their roles, uh, specifically for Anyeka. I think that. There's opportunity there if he can showcase them in longer minutes. Like I said, that he can really hold it down at the five spot. If they move off of Clint, I think Jalen Johnson's going to slot in nicely. 
um, you know, with John Collins, you know, being moved off into to Utah now. So the two of them playing off each other, uh, I really like there in Atlanta. Um, if they can get that sorted out with Trey and DeJounte too, the Atlanta team is going to be nice. I don't know what their ceiling is right now. I really got to see, you know, them start the season off now having that full off season there with Quinn Snyder as the coach. But uh, I like the the young front court pairing between the two of them. So I'm hopeful that it can, it can work out. Yeah, that could be solid. And I like I like how you said it. It fits well with what they should be doing with uh, Trey and Dejounte over there because mm-hmm. I feel like Trey Young gets a lot of a lot of disrespect that he does not deserve. Like I yeah. feel like with that team running that fast paced offense, I feel like it'd be really fun to see, and I feel like it'd be really good for him. So I like that a lot. Um, my next guy. So my next guy is actually I have Tyrese Maxey. Um, mm, yeah, I th- I think that. So already his points per game every single year he's been in the league has increased. He went from eight points to seventeen to twenty this past year, and I was with James Harden. I was alongside James Harden. Now obviously James Harden was mainly a facilitator, but he's still James Harden. He still was there. He still was getting his shots. So I just think that um, of the fact that James Harden he's asking out. He wants to trade to another team. I don't know if he's going to get traded or not. If he does get traded. That instantly, because they're not going to get a star player back. They're not going to get an all-star caliber player back with James Harden at this point in his career. That instantly bumps up Maxi to be the second option over there, which immediately that means more shots, obviously. That means more points. That means more responsibility. Mm-hmm. So it's like he's going to put up even better numbers that he did than he did this past year. But even if they don't trade they don't trade James Harden, I think that Maxi he showed improvements every single year to make me believe that I don't know if he can be a 2 on a championship level team, but I think that as the years progress, he's going to put up numbers that would be of a number two, basically, alongside Joel Embiid. Because, obviously, we know Joel Embiid is going to take the pressure off of everybody. He's going to be the main focus for defenses. They're, they're, all their attention is going to be on Joel Embiid. And Maxi, with his, his ability to shoot, his ability to create for himself, his ability to be to run out in transition, I just feel like he's going to fit. He fits already great alongside Joel Embiid. And I think that he will benefit off of the attention that Joel Embiid is going to bring. And mm-hmm. like I said, if James Harden, if he leaves or if he just becomes more of a, a facilitator, more of a, a pure point guard, basically, I think Maxi could take that lead forward and really become the two, the second option for this team offensively. So I, I think he's going to, I think he could have a really good year. I think he could have a, if Harden leaves, I think he could be an all-star. I think he could put up numbers to be an all-star. I think he for, could be like the type of all-star that we saw, like right on the outside, like we saw with a guy like um, Tyrese or um, Ant, where it was like, one of them, or I guess De'Aaron Fox also was like an injury replacement this past year. Like alternative, year. yeah. Right, so I think he could be right on the outside there, but... Alternate, my bad. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree with what you said. Like, obviously, the PPG going up every single year, um, and then with Harden probably being out the door, like, he made it pretty clear he wants to be in a, a, a clipper. Um, I think that... He, he'll transition also from being the two to they're probably going and playing the point guard role for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I easily can see a world where he's putting up 25 plus points a night easily. Uh, and him and Joel become the new tandem there um, in Philly. I like that a lot. Um, I'm interested to see how he can handle kind of like full time guard duties um, and really like the additional load of having to be like, they're also like their primary playmaker. Um, Cause I imagine they'll probably do him and probably DeAnthony Mellon at the two. Uh, but I think it'll be great defensively. Um, if he can obviously just get to a solid level with the playmaking, you don't need to do anything crazy. Hopefully Nick nurse will just like force Joel to get in the post. And like, I don't need mm-hmm. anything complicated. Like just give him the ball. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And then obviously the, the pick and roll between the two of them, like you're gonna have this, basically just as lethal um, as you would have between him and James, and the ability for both of them to be able to score in a variety of ways. Lots of options coming off of that, you know, that screen action. So I like it a lot. Tyrese Maxey's a guy I didn't have down, but definitely like he's a, easily could be a guy I think taking that leap to becoming a legit All Star guard um, this year. Um, yeah, I, I like that one a lot. Um, the next guy I have on my list is Keegan Murray. Mm, um, I like that. There was a report that came out uh, not too long ago that said that the Kings really believe that Keegan Murray can like 
be like a for real, for real offensive star in this league. And like, there's a world where like he is the second option on this hey, Kings team. Like, not Sabonis is Keegan. I can um, see it. And look. Again, it's summer league, so I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> overblow it. But Man. the same thing you said about Jabari, right? The way that he was able to score, he start. He, and he didn't even play in the Vegas summer league. He played them two games in the California Classic, and they're like, "We've seen enough. Save right. it for the rest of the season." <laughs> uh, which is like, look, going from being a starter on the three seed in the Western Conference. And play, like, not even just like you're a starter, cool. It's like, no, you're starting, you're playing big minutes, you're hitting big shots. Like, you're a legitimate contributor in a playoff series against the defending champions. And then going to play in summer league the next year, um, it's going to have high expectations. And I think he blew my expectations out of the water in the two games that he played. Um, we saw significantly more ball handling than I've ever seen from him. He's getting the rebound. He's bringing it up the court himself. He's handling in the pick and roll. The shot creation, I'm seeing him take people off the dribble. I'm seeing tween, tween. I seen mm-hmm. I saw him hit a James Harden step back with a little double shuffle, whatever. Right. <laughs> um, and knocking it down in people's faces. I think the first first attempt he took in summer league, he caught a poster on somebody. Like he is taking his game to a new level. Um, And I think we talked about this before where he, the Kings were linked to Kyle Kuzma for a little bit, obviously, before he re-signed in Washington. And I was like, oh, it's a great fit. You know, you bring in Kyle Kuzma. I wasn't sure if they were going to bring in Harrison Barnes back at the time. Um, So that makes a lot of sense. You know, you bring Kuzma, great rebounder, uh, you know, can play good defense. And obviously, we know we're getting a 20 PPG type of guy um, who can stretch the floor, great shooter. They don't do that. They keep Keegan in. Think about it. It's like, Keegan can be better than Kuzma, like, potentially. Like, um, so I think that makes a ton of sense. I think we already know what he can be as a shooter. Um, even just last season, obviously, he shot 41% from three as a rookie, shooting three and a half threes per game, which is like extremely good. We're just talking about how many rookies come in inefficient, coming in and shooting 41% from three. That's That's really big. Um, putting up 12, uh, 12 points a night, almost five rebounds there. Um, and then uh, almost a steal and half a block as well. Um, I think that next season, he's going to be able to showcase a little bit of what we saw from him in summer league. I think we'll see more of him getting comfortable, not just having to sit there and be a catch and shoot guy, but you no know, pump fake, take a guy off the dribble, like, catch it on the wing, hold on, I'm going to create for myself, be able to do some some self-creation there, some shot creation, um, be able to probably see a lot more DHO action between him and Sabonis. Um, and that could get their offense really, really scary because now you've got De'Aaron off the ball, you've got Malik Monk off the ball, Kevin Herter off the ball. It could be a lot of screen and motion going on there in Sacramento. Um, and you then have three guys who you're really comfortable with I, almost four, really, when you include um, Malik Monk there as well. Right. You know, handling the ball in a lot of different offensive sets. And at the same time, a lot of them are all very effective playing off the ball as well. Um, so Sacramento becomes a very, very versatile team on the offensive side of the ball. Um, and then, you know, Mike Brown's very good defensive coach. He had them playing very scrappy defense when they needed to. They weren't the best defensive team, you know, by the, you know, by the stats last year, but – um, we saw it in the Warrior series. Like he brought in Davion Mitchell, and Davion Mitchell was putting Steph in as close to jail as we've really ever seen Steph get put in in some of those games. Like he, he's mm-hmm. doing what he can to kind of disrupt his rhythm. So uh, I'm excited for this Kings team as a whole, but really Keegan Murray to kind of take that step, expand his offensive role a little bit. Um, like I said, the the report came out. I'm not sure you know how much truth there is to it, but. Um, I could really see a world where he kind of surpasses Sabonis as being like the second solidified option there. And then you really have Sabonis as being like the, the engine hub kind of as the offense between him and Fox. Um, but a lot of that starts with, you know, some of his post action and his DHO. And then obviously just him being a crafty passer there as a big. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm really excited for this next season for Keegan. You know, honestly, I kind of I, I 
you know, there's a lot of a lot of times that when a, a team comes out, and they obviously you're gonna talk up your players. You know, what I mean, it's your players. You want to make them sound good, but I, I think there's some truth to what they're saying. Just because, like, I was a little bit confused. I'm like, why are you si- signing Harrison Barnes back mm-hmm. instead of going to get a guy like Kuzma? Like, he can help you guys win now. But like, if right. they truly believe that Keegan Murray could be that guy, that I, then I like then the signing makes sense because it's like Harrison Barnes eventually can like phase out and then we could really have Keegan Murray slide into that spot and he can really be that guy offensively for us and Kuzma wouldn't be here to to hinder the development of a Keegan Murray or take some of the minutes mm-hmm. away from him so it, not nah, it, it genuinely makes sense so I like it he was he was a starter for them last year I can't remember Keegan Murray did he start yeah, the he, four for them yeah he started okay. he started he played 80 games started 78 of them okay got he started yeah. all of them in the in that so, first round matchup against Golden so yeah. State I mean, it makes sense because you've seen the signs. Like you said, it you said it before. It's like, bro, he was a starter against the defending champs in the playoffs as a rookie. Like that should already tell you, like that this guy is ready for the moment already, and mm-hmm. he's only gonna get better. And if he's at this point now, if he develops, he's gonna be something special. So, right. nah, it, it definitely makes sense. He wasn't on my list, but one hundred percent a great candidate. Like I can one hundred percent see a breakout for him. So, yeah, um, yeah, man, that's. That's and crazy. look, when you think about it too, right? Like they got Harrison Barnes on a three-year, fifty-four million dollar deal, so he's making what that seventeen million dollars a year. That ain't much, man. Um, right? And then it's like when you compare that to what Kyle Kuzma just got. Kuzma's getting what twenty-five. Yeah, twenty-five a year. It was like a hundred some change, mm-hmm. right? And it's a four-year deal, so it's like you get Harrison on significantly cheaper than uh, what you got. Kuzma on, he already has, like, he's been in the locker room. He's been a good vet for that team. Um, the only guy on that team that's been a champion, um, I think the only guy on that team that's even made the finals. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a great veteran experience for that roster. Like we said, then it's like you keep Keegan. Keegan develops to a level where he's putting out the similar type of production um, like Kyle Kuzma, arguably going to be a better, at least a more efficient shooter than Kuzma as well. Um and like he might have better shot creation too. Like he, his ceiling, I think, is at this point has the potential to very easily surpass Kyle Kuzma. And it's like you, you got Harrison Barnes on the steal. Like I think they went about this the right way. So I'm very, very interested to see how he takes this step going into year two. Um, Cause they've really kept their roster mostly the same. Um, they didn't do a lot of like really any type of splash signing, just kind of retool. They lost a couple of guys. Um, like deep, deep off their bench. Um, but their core rotation is going to be basically the same. Um, obviously, they were one of the most healthy teams. I don't know if they're going to be able to maintain that for another year, but that's a big reason why they're able to get the three seed. But I think they're easily probably going to be a playoff team again. Um, we saw that they gave the Warriors a, a run for their money. Um, and, you know, if they had a little bit more experience, you know, they kind of maybe don't make a few mistakes there in some of those games, like, that, that series probably doesn't go seven. Like, they could probably close that out sooner. Um, yeah. So, now that they've got the experience under their belt, like I said Keegan's going to develop. I'm very, very excited to see this Kings team next year. We should do a segment on, like, what each team needs to do to be a contender. Because it's like, if Keegan Murray develops, are these guys legitimate, like, contenders in the West? Not just like, oh, they're going to be a high seed. They're probably going to lose to the more experienced team. It's like, yeah. if he really reaches that point, and then you have De'Aaron Fox, like you said, then you have Sabonis, and you have Malik Monk as well. It's like, what's stopping them from being a team that actually can compete for real? Yeah. I think there may be like one or two defenders off. Like, their, their defense – in terms of like defensive rating was not it is questionable, great yeah. last year. Obviously their bread and butter was like the defense is phenomenal, but it's like we have Sabonis and Fox. Like <laughs> mm-hmm, right. and <laughs> like two of the best lefties <laughs> in the NBA, um, who can run so many different types of actions because of how versatile Sabonis is. Um, so their offense became very difficult to guard. So that's been their bread and butter. I think if they can bring in Another wing defender, and they need a rim protector still, I think. Somebody that can at least give them, like, 15 to 20 minutes and, like, ideally a guy they can play alongside Sabonis for large stretches. Uh, That coupled with Keegan Murray's development, then I think we could legitimately talk, like, this team could make some serious noise and, you know, 
at least make it a tough series. They got into, you know, any series with some of the big dogs out there in the West. But um, the defense, I think, has to still improve. They, they got to find one or two more pieces on that side of the floor just because you're going up against a guy like – even if you go think about try, them trying to match up against Denver right now, it's like, they will get their full day. I'm not going to lie. They yeah. will. So I see Boris why they were trying to go cooked. get Draymond. Right. That would have been, been great. It would have mm-hmm. been a great, great fit for them. And look, at the same time, if you got Draymond, I think you could very easily slot Keegan Murray at the three. Oh, yeah. And then you got some length, some switchability. Like, I, look. You still got spacing. They can go and find one good defensive big, somebody – like, obviously, you're not going to be able to get Draymond at this point, but somebody that's switchable. You can find someone that's switchable and can provide a little bit of rim protection. This team gets very serious very quick. Like, obviously, them being the three seed, like, I think that they could have won the series against the Warriors. Either way, I don't think they would have beaten the Lakers team. Um, but it's like, you go out and get a guy like that who can bring something additional on the defensive side of the ball. This team gets very at least a little bit more serious and can't be disregarded as like a first or second round exit. Like mm-hmm. they get very, they get a lot more competitive um, with that. Cause I do think Davion Mitchell is legitimately like, like we saw with the series against the Warriors, he can come in and like lock up your best guard. Like we saw him make Steph Curry have to work for every single shot when he was on the floor. And it's like, that is like up here. If you're going up against any other guard in the league, like that's only going to be amplified because like it's only so much you can do to stop Steph. Exactly. Right? So we know what he can bring. The wing defense is a little questionable. The rim defense is a little questionable. He brings my in to kind of answer some of those. The Sacramento team can be uh can be for real here in a couple years. Hundred percent. So yeah, I mean that was all my players. That's that was all my breakout guys. So. Yeah. I got I got one guy left um, before we kind of move on to some of the off the court drama that always comes up in the absolute dead of the off season. <laughs> um, but I got um I got Mark Williams uh, out there in Charlotte. Okay. Who honestly going back to the draft, I was a little bit surprised at how that all kind of panned out because that like was like picks like nine or 10 through like 13 or 14 there was like so much trading and swapping that happened between the knicks the hornets and the the pistons that nobody knew where anybody went until like it's like everybody's refreshing twitter like for 20 minutes trying to figure out who went where Mm -hmm. and the hornets ending ended up going with mark williams instead of jalen Dern, which to me at the time i thought i would have taken Dern over mark williams um and I, both of them are great players in their own right. I think they're both excelling for their roles. Um, but Mark Williams did really, really well there in his first season in Charlotte. Um, his full season totals, you know, nine points, seven rebounds, and a block a game. Um, and, and on 20 minutes, 20 minutes a night. Um, so when you look at his part 36, that jumps up to almost 17 points, two blocks, a steal, and 13 rebounds. Um, on 63% from the field. Um, And then even when you look at, you know, his he played 14 games after the All-Star break. He came on a lot better after the All-Star break. That jumped up to a double-double, so 12 points and 10 rebounds and almost a block a game there after the All-Star break. Um, So he got a lot more comfortable there. Um, And, again, he's one of those bigs that we talk about them a ton on the podcast, but they do the basics of what you want an athletic big to do very well. He can screen set. Rim run, athletics, we could be a lob threat. He protects the rim very well. Um, and so I think he's a guy who we could see jump up very easily into, you know, if the minutes are there for him, which they should be this year. I think there's no reason why he shouldn't be the starter um, in Charlotte. Um, where he's putting up maybe more than two blocks a game, um, giving you over 10 rebounds. It can give you 10, 12 points. Again, with LaMelo being kind of the, the screener roller um, and, again, lob threat. And if he can become – I'm not saying he needs to be a great playmaker, but if he can just add a little bit of that, you know, connector vibe where it's like, you know, short roll, you get it, you see the defense kind of rotate over, and now you kick out, 
now you're kicking it out to you know Brandon Miller or whatever. Um, I think that could be a make a huge leap for their offense. Um, and again, justify him being able to play and start, you know, get a lot more minutes there in Charlotte. So I think Mark Williams has the opportunity here to really jump up, um, be one of the better rim protectors in the league, one of the better just overall, again, all around good bigs um, who defend well and do kind of the, the gritty things of offense well. So uh, I'm excited to see how the fit there with Brandon Miller, um, you know, kind of works out for the Charlotte team. And then obviously we know what him and LaMelo can do um, last season. So I'm ex- hopeful and interested to see that he gets the starting role there and then can get up to, you know, 28 minutes a night um, there in Charlotte. And like to see what his, his stats roll out to be. Like I said, per 36, he's putting up like 17 and 12 with two blocks. Mm-hmm. So if you can give him some good minutes. I think he'll be able to put up good, good numbers there in Charlotte. Yeah, I think he could fit pretty well. I've seen a couple of his games before. He's, I like him as a big man. Like you say, he does all the stuff that you want your big right. man to do, your athletic big. I like his game a lot, and I think he does fit well with who they're going to have out there in Charlotte. Um, it's funny because we, we talk a lot about how we obviously both of us would have picked Scoot over Brandon Miller, but fit-wise, it, it all of it does make sense. Like This team is constructed in a way that they all, all of their games kind of complement each other. So it's going to be interesting to see what this Charlotte team does because – I think they can make the play in. You know what I mean? I think I don't think they'll be a team that'll just be one of the worst teams in the league. I think they'll everyone healthy. Um, they're they're gonna have Brandon Miller. They're gonna have Lamelo Ball. They're gonna have Miles Bridges back. All that stuff aside, but just basketball player wise, I mean they'll they'll have a team that fits well. They'll be fun to watch. They'll be fast paced. They'll be able to run up and down the floor. I like I like the Charlotte team a little bit. I do. I am very very. Interested to see is the, the right word. Like I, uh, and again, summer league is not end all be all. Obviously, Brandon Miller struggled in summer league. Hornets summer league team they in general s- struggled. They did not have a <laughs> point guard. Their offense looked abysmal for large, large stretches of time. Um, I think the only like legitimate concrete takeaway we can give is James Booknight or that talk that 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 clock is ticking. Very, very loudly right now. You yeah, got to make yeah. some shape um, there in Charlotte because it did not look good in summer league, which is not a good sign. Um, but look, we know what Lamelo is. We know what he can be. Um, we saw what he, him and uh, Mark Williams can do. So I think the three of them together, they can kind of start to maybe build out a young core there between the three of them. Like I said, I liked him a lot coming out of Duke for the same reasons as why he's effective there in Charlotte. Rim protector, good rebounder. Uh, athletic big he's got the size I think he's seven one um you know mm-hmm. you know he's not slender like he's built well wasn't built like Jalen Duren Jalen Duren came out of uh was it was it Memphis right I don't, let me make sure I got I'm his not college sure. right um but Jalen Duren came out of the the draft um yeah it was Memphis bro is like built like was built in college yeah. and that <laughs> translated very quickly um so that's that's really why I wanted them to to take him I just think he as good as like a lob threat and rim protector that Mark Williams was, I think Jalen Duren was that at an even greater level coming out of college. Um, and we've seen that, you know, with him in Detroit. So with all these young point guards, a lot of them have got their, their young athletic center who can do right. <laughs> right all the pick and roll, all the, you know, the lob threat big. So um, either way, if, if LaMelo didn't have him, now Kay's got Jalen to, you know, throw lobs too. But yeah, for both of those guys, now we're talking about Jalen Duran too. I hope he has a you know good breakout year. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he did, he hasn't gotten to play really with Cade at all. No, no um, yeah, because Cade's been hurt. Cade actually was a guy that was on. He wasn't like on my list. He was on like my honorable mentions, basically, as a guy yeah. who I think could have a solid year too. Because, like you said, all last year he was basically hurt. He played like what 12, 10, 12 games, something like yeah, that. Yeah, he basically um, didn't play. <laughs> yeah, like he, he basically sat out this whole year, so. I think he'll have a solid year as well because like we talked about guys who has the tools to be a superstar in, in this league. I'm talking about a six six point guard in, in the NBA who can facilitate an offense, who can create mm-hmm. for himself. And then you have solid pieces around him that can that he can get the ball to him and they can do things for himself. I think that Cade obviously could have a really good really good bounce back year. I just hope that he doesn't have like a like he was out this this all last year. I just hope that this isn't like his sophomore year, like a sophomore slump type of oh, thing. Yeah. And it's more of like, okay, I was out, but like my game still developed. Like I'm still 
I've, I've been working out in the NBA. I've been like, my game is still developing basically to the point mm-hmm. where this third year is going to be like my breakout year. And I'm going to show people why I was the number one overall pick. Yeah, I think that having Jalen there is going to help prevent that kind of sophomore slump from happening. Because mm-hmm. um, again, his, his rookie year, he's playing most of that center spot was uh, Isaiah Stewart. So, you know, with obviously as they start coming back and they bring in Wiseman too. Um, I think Jalen Duran should be the long-term starting five there. Um, and so having him there as again, the pick and roll threat, um, the lob threat, you're going to have um, a SAR, a SAR there too. Still got Bogdanovich as a shooter. Um, Killian Hayes, who progressed a little bit <laughs> last year. Uh, obviously, in Cade's absence, um, I'm excited to see the two of them play together. I think they'll be very, very dynamic on the offensive side of the ball. And then, uh, as much as we talked about the Rockets and their their defense, like the Pistons have a very, very big team with a lot of switchable defenders. And mm-hmm. I think Asar is going to be an all defensive type of basketball player for a long time he looks like a better Um, defender than his brother he does and it's like it's so crazy like that one clip of him in summer league i think highlights him as a player so well like guarding up on the perimeter putting his guy in a straight jacket literally just took the ball away from him right (laughs) immediately is pushing it in transition one pass give and go reverse lob finish like now imagine that with Kate. <laughs> like, right, exactly. That is going to be, if nothing else, a league pass team. I'm watching that night in, night out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, this Pistons team, I think, is going to – I don't know where any of these young team ceilings are. I don't know. Obviously, everybody can't make the, the playoffs or the play in this year, but um, I'm, I'm excited for this team. Excited for this team and excited to see Kate back healthy and getting some run with, with Jalen Duran there. 100%. Um. Cool. I like this. I like this because I really I got some time to like sit down and really think about guys who I think are really gonna make a leap. Like we have, we I think we covered it all. Like we covered guys who we think could become superstars, guys who could become all stars, and a lot of guys who are just gonna go from being like role players or not getting a ton of minutes. People that are legitimate quality NBA players. Um, This was fun. I like it. Yeah, this was was real fun. This is good. Um, getting into the reality TV portion <laughs> of the off season, uh, and we're gonna go through these quickly because we gotta cover them. But like, it's just <laughs> it's literally just like drama. Um, so Draymond was on Pat Bev's podcast, um, and he uh, addressed the Jordan Poole situation, um, basically saying, you know, I got the direct quotes here. He said, I don't just hit people. Dialogue happens and dialogue happens over the course of time. You usually aren't just triggered by something like that fast to that degree. This is a team. Nobody on my team is triggering me in an instant. We know stuff you don't say amongst men. We know things that you have to stand on. He said, as I've admitted before, I was in the wrong in the way I handled it for the situation where we were. But clearly he feels like Jordan Poole says something that you just aren't going to say to another man. Like he said fighting words. It's basically the gist of what he's saying. Um, so after all that came out on the podcast, got released. Um, <laughs> Jordan Poole's dad was not having that. <laughs> and he said that he'll stand on that all of this stuff that Draymond is saying is some BS. He said Jordan Poole used to be his guy and he avoided me. He's saying that Draymond avoided him, Jordan Poole's dad, all of last season. And I'm going to bleep this part out because he was kind of letting it go. But he said, he is a soft (laughs) A-B. And I'm standing on this. He didn't apologize to me or my wife. So he's lame. And me and him can meet anytime he wants. So (laughs) Draymond said, Jordan Poole was talking with some fighting words. Jordan Poole's dad is explicitly now trying to fight. <laughs> uh, Man, so that's, 
And really, in all of this, I only just feel bad for Jordan Poole because it feels Honestly. like he's been trying to move on from this situation for ever. Like <laughs> as soon as it happened, and all the media in Washington people have asked him about it. He's like, look, I'm not in Golden State anymore. Like, let's talk about Washington. Like, let's move on from it. Because at the end of the day, like, it's got to be embarrassing. Like, that video never in a million years should have leaked out. But it did. The drama that it caused probably internally and just in his life, like, to have to go through a day-to-day knowing that you just got rocked by your teammate on camera and the whole world saw it. Um, so, yeah, and amidst all of this, like, Back and forth drama between Draymond and Jordan Poole's dad is unneeded. And I really just feel bad for, for JP and all of it. My thing is, right, this happened at the beginning of last season to a guy that is no longer even on your team anymore. Why are you still talking about this? That like To me, it does not make sense because it's like, okay, you're asked about it. I get it. Jordan, like you just said, Jordan Poole is asked about it as well. He's moved on i'm not one i don't want to talk about it i'm in washington now like he's not no longer with the team it's like draymond acts like if you get asked a question i 100 percent got to answer it like i have to answer it no matter what mm-hmm. it's like no you can choose to say all right that situation happened cool we moved on i apologize that situation is done and over with you keep bringing why do you keep bringing it up over and over and over again like the situation is old like move on you keep trying to bring it up and the guy who you punched is moved on already i probably yeah. not mentally but just publicly <laughs> <laughs> just publicly he's moved on like why are you bringing it up still like that to me i just don't get it because it's like it's like you want to talk about it like you want to keep talking about it because you keep bringing it up over and over and over again and then the whole comments of like you say he said something that you shouldn't say to no man Draymond, you said you said the same thing. You did the same thing to Kevin Durant. You did the same thing to LeBron, and now y'all best friends. It's like, bro, I'm not hearing that. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing that. Cause like talking about he said this, he said that. You said you said worse to Kevin Durant apparently that got him wanting to leave. Mm-hmm. You said the same thing to LeBron, but y'all are cool now. Y'all best friends. Like, I don't know, Draymond. I, I just I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah, and, and Draymond responded to, to Jordan Poole's dad and said, that's so cute. It's impossible to avoid you at an arena for a year, champ. I got to go get my family from the same family room that you're in every game and stop using those words. They usually don't go over well amongst men. Look, <laughs> it, it's just so unnecessary at this point. Like you said, bro, we are over a almost – literally to a day like a year removed from this situation let it lie bro is not even on the team anymore that's the thing you're not like he's not on your team why are you even talking about the jordan he's not on the warriors anymore worry about the people that are on your team i don't get that all right and i look i'll be the first person to admit we both seen it firsthand playing sports like teammates fight and sometimes, bro, it like people throw hands. Like it just that's a reality. It's a, a huge environment. Times. Like mm-hmm. people fight. The issue here is really that it got leaked out to the public. And it's a little bit different when like, okay, we're all in high school, we're like 15, 16 year olds, and like somebody shoves somebody after a play and it turned into a whole fist fight versus you are like 34. <laughs> Y'all are all right. professionals. This is your job. You're getting paid for this. And you're punching. You're the vet, the heart and soul of the locker room, punching the 22-year-old young guy. Like, the optics are different. And, the like, the responsibility has to be different. Like, you know, like I said, was, this happened in high school, college, whatever. That's one thing. Bro, if any of us in our day jobs – got mad at a co-worker and was like bro what you say boom we are getting fired point blank you're getting fired you might get arrested like so it it can't it has to be held to a higher standard at the same time like you can understand it because emotions run hot but you you got to hold it to a higher standard so obviously he's I was going to say, he's come out, he apologized for, you know, he had that segment on TNT where he did the whole, like, got a two-minute apology video. Um, 
but like you said, bro, it's, it happened a year ago. Y'all need to let it lie. It needs to let it be because clearly Jordan Poole is trying to move on from it. And, like, that should be enough indicator for y'all to be, like, including his dad to, like, bro, just if he wants to talk about it, let him talk about it. Like, just let it go because you're just creating more unnecessary drama for him. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Draymond hasn't been a good leader to these young guys, bro, because he's I heard punching people in the face. You saw that he don't got a relationship with Kaminga with, uh, and mm-hmm. seeing that. It's like, I don't know. Draymond's been, he's been out here bugging, man. I don't know. I don't know, but th- I'll tell you one thing: the war, the Warrior season's over, and it didn't even start yet. The Warrior season is done. They are already talking about stuff that happened in the past. Then you got him talk, still talking about the Chris Paul, like saying, like, "Oh yeah, I said I didn't like him. That hasn't changed, but <laughs> I'm excited to work with him." Like what? <laughs> like that hasn't changed. Honestly, Draymond, he talks too much. <laughs> like Draymond needs to just handle all of this without a camera and without a mic. Like, I'm fine with you having a podcast. I'm never going to be like, players shouldn't talk about this. No, you're fine. You have your podcast, whatever. But there's certain things that he just shouldn't say. Like, he, honestly, he's been talking too much for a while. Because remember that thing he talked about with Steph? I forgot what it was. That has something to do with, like, Steph and LeBron. Um, Oh, my God. I forgot what it was. But it was, like, Steph was – it was something that had to do with the Lakers series or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was just too much information, like basically like throwing stuff under the bus. I forgot exactly what it was. Just like he's been talking way too much, like been saying too <laughs> much personal information, too much stuff that just shouldn't be said on a podcast or on the media in general. It needs to be handled behind closed doors. But I guarantee you, matter of fact, I'll ask you this question over under one and a half altercations for the Warriors this season. Over. <laughs> because between over. him. And Chris like, Paul. if you're, I, I'm talking about like these are certified stamp. We know what happens because you know it's good. Bro, as soon as training camp starts, some beat writer is just gonna make up some lie and be like, Draymond Green and Chris Paul seen butting heads at practice. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, but like, look, if you're already willing to go as far just to be like, and at the same time, like, I can respect that you're not being fake or phony. Like, you did say that you didn't like Chris Paul before, so I respect the fact that you're like, I said it, I meant it, I still mean it. Like, I don't really <laughs> care for you like that. I can respect that, but at the same time... But why are you saying it? Right, like, the, again, the optics of it. Like, bro, you are a vet, a leader on this team that still has a decent amount of young guys, like... And even just for team morale as a whole, like, if I'm Steph, I would just be like, bro, why? Like, why are you saying that? This dude ain't even come to the locker room yet. And you saw he's he's talking about some, I'm not a bit, not coming off the bit. I'm telling you, their season is done. I'm telling you, bro, it's done before they even started. You got Chris Paul talking about some. <laughs> you said, like, how, how do you feel about contributing off the bench? He said, you the coach. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> As you had me crying, bro. Said you the coach. <laughs> oh, like damn, like, bro, you're I, coming I, I, off the bench, bro. I get I, where he coming from too, cause like, nah, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't. I'm, I I'm don't. saying it from the perspective of like, bro. I'm Chris Paul. Like, I'm one of the best PGs ever. Who are you as a reporter to be like? How you know I'm about to be off the bench? You're not a reporter with coach. common sense. She had common sense to know that a lineup with with. Chris Paul, Curry, Clay, Wiggins, and Draymond is not winning anything and is not guarding a parked car. Like, she's not dumb. Like, park, you're park, not park starting. putting up at least 15. <laughs> at least. At least. Shooting 40% from three. Like, come on, bro. Like, listen, I'm telling you, Chris Paul, I, I had more. It made more sense for Carmelo when he was doing the whole why am I coming off the bench thing. Because at that point in his career, I think Carmelo was coming off being an all-star. Like, Camelo mm-hmm. was still a, a solid player. Chris Paul, bro, no. You're a six foot, 38 year old point guard who cannot stay healthy. And at this point in your career, is a defensive liability. You're not starting. And if you're starting, right. the Warriors and Steve Kerr are idiots. Because shouldn't, that shouldn't be your starting lineup at all. That's going to be terrible. I would say we talked about this months ago, right? When it first started being reported that Bob Myers might leave. They bring in Mike Dunleavy, right? They promote him to GM. I would give Mike Dunleavy a solid, bro, a F. 
<laughs> F grade, like yeah. bro. In one off season, you shipped out Jordan Poole for Chris Paul again. Take the anything on the court related. You brought in a guy who your coach, your star players have beef with in the past, coming off of a year where your internal locker room turmoil was one of the biggest storylines. <clears throat> How do you do that? Nah, that's still stupid. <laughs> that's like, so stupid. bro, what? They're done, bro. They're cooked. Of, bro, of all the, all the players in the league, you could have went and found anybody. You picked the, like, one of the only... I mean, I know Draymond probably got beat for a lot of people. But, mm -hmm. like, you went and found somebody he's explicitly talked about not liking when your whole last season was like literally just like riddled with the fact that he went and knocked out your your new young 120 million dollar contract player in training camp like that cannot it cannot be a good recipe and then again like you just said on top of that obviously after the injuries clay is not the defender he used to be like steph i think is I'm going to say this. I think he's underrated on defense because people be labeling him as a horrible defender, and I don't think he's that bad. I just Not don't anymore. Think he's, right. I just don't think he's a great defender. I think he still has active hands. He can get you some steals. Effort, like, but, like, he don't, he don't have the tools to really be a, a like, really good defender. Mm -hmm. Chris Paul is too old to be, like, like you said, he's a defensive liability. Clay is a defensive liability after the injuries. They need to take them badges off of 2K because he probably still got like, <laughs> he probably still got like clamps on gold. Defensive stopper. They on need the to thing. take all the defensive badges off. Not that he's a horrible <laughs> defender, but again, it's like he's not the defender. He's not the two-way player that he used to be. How are the three of y'all gonna play together? It's not gonna work, bro. Chris who's, Paul, who's so then in his mind, Wiggins is coming off the bench. Yeah, best defenders coming off the bench. Wiggins was the two option when y'all just won the ring. <laughs> Wiggins is not coming off the bench, bro. I'm sorry. No, bro. You're coming off the bench. I'd rather have Wiggins on my team right now than you. I would. He would bring me more to my team, and he'll be there when I need him. He missed a chunk of the season and still was there for the playoffs playing quality minutes. All right. Like, no, bro. You're You're coming off the bench, and it's okay. It's okay. I, I think about it. How is this lineup even going to work as far as just the offense? How's it going to work? So it's like, all right, let's say Wiggins comes off the bench, right? It is Curry, Paul, Clay, Draymond, Looney. Looney. Chris Paul likes to run pick and rolls. Him and Who Looney are you running crazy. a pick and roll with? Him and Looney. That's disgusting. I'd throw up watching that. <laughs> like you, Chris Paul's too old to be running off screens. He's he's not setting the off ball screens. He's not, bro. Okay, but this though, you put uh, him and Looney running a pick and roll. You got Draymond running some elevator screen type action. Him and Clay setting picks for Steph. They doing all this crazy off ball motion. Feel me? So now all Chris got to do is make the right read. You got Looney at the rim. He could pull up for his own midi. Steph and Clay doing <laughs> curl routes and comebacks, zigzags all Listen, over the court. If Looney and Chris Paul are running a pick and roll. Get the rebound because we're going back and on offense. That is not the recipe for success in 2023, bro. I'm sorry. Chris Paul and Looney pick and roll is not going to cut it, bro. I'm sorry. This is what I'll also say, too, bro. Like, Chris Paul is going to be 39, I think. His birthday is, like, later in the season. So he'll end up being 39 at some point next year. Mm. Bro, there is no shame at this point in your career at being a 39-year-old and coming off the bench. That's like, what I'm saying. Like, I don't see why you had to snap on the reporter. You're coming off the bench, and it's not even like a knock on you. You're just not a starting caliber point guard right now. Like, we, any, the vast, vast majority of players we've seen play into this age, like, they become bench players. The first person that comes to mind is, like, Vince Carter. He played super late in his age. Bro, he was on Atlanta. He was not really getting ticked at all. Like, he mm -hmm. just was a vet in the locker room. Right. Like, you at that point, you just, you're doing it for the love of the game, and you still have something to contribute a little bit on the court. A lot more of your benefit is off the, like, off the court, the vet mentality. Like, you're one of the greatest point guards ever. Like, I mean, they don't have Jordan Poole anymore, so I would have been a great person to kind of get in his ear. But, like, get in with the young guys, like, help build the culture. Um, so, like, 
that's just the role that it is, I think, for Chris Paul. I think his high level of basketball IQ and acumen will pre- prevent it from being like a flop. Like he'll find a way to make it work to an extent, but it's not the most natural fit. Like you said, they, they didn't go out and get a big again. F Mike Dunley. <laughs> like, so they're still really working with Looney. They're giving up a lot of size in the West that just was dominated by a seven foot Serbian monster. Like, bro, <laughs> it just, I, I'm going to have to agree with you. This, this season is might be cooked for Golden State, which is a shame, bro. Cause there are legit arguments that like the Steph Curry that we saw last year may have been one of the most complete Steph Curry seasons, like, doing arguably more on the offensive side of the ball. I think his finishing is better than it's ever been. Like his ability to get to the basket, finishing through contact, bro. He's eating a lot of and ones crafty finish with both hands. Obviously like he just, I think this is just like a different form of Steph than we saw during kind of like his MVP runs. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's really on the same level of player, which is why he's still the best point guard in the league and I think to me is probably the best point guard ever like just by pure people that played that position um and it's a shame that like again they had the whole double timeline thing this these are the moves that they made to consolidate and just say well the double timeline ain't gonna work let's just maximize this timeline and they maximize this timeline by getting Chris Paul yeah it's it's tough because and I, I I don't want to say they wasted it because they they did win the championship, so it's not like they completely wasted this um like this more all around version of Steph Curry. But it is tough to see that the fact that they they definitely messed up as far as like building a, another championship level team around Curry because like you said, and I think Draymond talked about it. He's been in the weight room like, and you can clearly see that like he doesn't just get pushed around anymore. Mm-hmm. Like like twenty yeah like twenty sixteen Steph was amazing and insane. But he did have his flaws. I think that was when he was a terrible defender. Like, that was when he was a defensive liability. And that was when he couldn't really finish. He could finish at the rim, like, at uh, great levels. But the and ones, the finishing through contact, it wasn't the same that, that, than it is right now. You could visibly see it. Like, he's he's not just a scrawny, skinny kid. Like, he's he's built. You know what I mean? So, mm. the, yeah, it's, it's tough because he still is at that level where, like, he's one of the best players in the league. Probably, like, a top three four player in the nba right now and they, they they're they're not gonna win anything this season i'm sorry like unless chris paul is on an expiring so like maybe best case scenario he's playing great first half of the season you trade him to a team you get some pieces i, I don't know i don't know but the way it's currently constructed and the way they're talking in the off season right now specifically draymond this season is cooked bro Unless I don't know, Kaminga seven foot now, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> seven two. He's That's seven what two. Ballsack Sports said, according to sources. According to sources, he's seven two now, so that might right. be the X factor right there. Who knows? And Kendrick Perkins back to you know they don't lie on ESPN. Bro. Kendrick Perkins, he only he only gets the top notch sources, bro. Like he right. know what he talking about. You know what I mean? He don't make mistakes. All right, come on now, carry the hell on. <laughs> <laughs> what, did he, what did he say on draft night? Mo- modus modus moody mo- oh yeah <laughs> couldn't get bro's name out oh my gosh espn is crazy did you see the um the thing they did on cam ron's podcast where they said that espn has been jacking them i didn't <laughs> took, see it took nah. their segment they on nba today they did like a like a cap or no cap segment with no Malika shot. Andrews. Ah, no <laughs> shot. And Cam- Cameron and Maze was on it. You know, it, it is what it is. And he was like, ESPN jacking our flow. Uh, he was like, y'all, I never seen y'all on ESPN talking about something that's cap. And y'all right. got, like, they was throwing, like, basketball caps at them on the screen or whatever. And he was like, I never seen y'all do that before until we did it and made it hot. And Maze was like, man, we're going to have to jack them back. Pause. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> You know, I honestly, I'd rather watch Cameron and Mace than ESPN right now. ESPN is in a terrible spot. Unless, unless they get my man Shannon Sharp. I don't know if you've seen that. Shannon Sharp might go on first take. I'd watch that. Just just because it's entertaining. Yo, <laughs> it's going to be mad entertaining. I'll give him that. I'll watch that. Shannon Sharp go on first take. So, yeah. damn, Skip Bayless, he's punching the air right now. 
OD. He don't need those show. Him and that Carlton dude, worse, like, bro. That, that matter of fact, I think that Carlton guy is the worst I've ever seen in my life as far as sports analysts. I've never seen a good take. I've never seen a take that was, wasn't was biased. I've never seen a take that was like, I see where you're coming from, but I disagree. Like, all of it is just like, bro, you do not know ball at Craig all. Craig Carton. I literally hadn't heard of this guy until you sent me the clip of what he said about Dame. Basically, like, he owes so much to Portland after no, requesting bro. a... Uh, trade, which is like, bro, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, you know what I seen? You know what I seen? He had, t- I forgot who was on the show, right? This dude, mind you, this is live television. This is supposed to be like where a lot of people get their ant, like get their analysis from. This dude said, LeBron, he shouldn't get a statue in L.A. Whatever, whether you agree with that or not, I don't really care. But his yeah. reasoning was what was what really got me. Dude said, you know, it's about the Lakers' tenure. You know, guys like. Kobe, Magic, Kareem, Shaq played their whole career with the Lakers. Like, huh? Like, I swear to God, I swear to God, <laughs> <laughs> played their whole career with the Lakers. So it's like you can't really get a statue like those guys. I was like, did you say Kareem and Shaq? Shaq? Shaquille O'Neal played his whole career with the Lakers. Both of them won rings with other teams that were the Lakers. <laughs> what are you talking like, bro? That's what I mean. And I'm like, bro, it's nothing but horrible takes. That is all I see over there. All right. That's Until all I see. To be honest, Kareem was the greatest. Mil- I mean, and like, still an argument for him to be the greatest Milwaukee Buck of mm-hmm. all time. Like, bro, that's dude, insane. Bro, I'm telling you, he, he that show needs to be canceled. It needs to be canceled. They said that was the same show that had somebody up there saying that. Um, oh, wasn't it? It was Tim Hardaway, matter of fact. Listen, I don't care if you play in the NBA. That don't instantly mean you know ball. I'm sorry. I do not care. Bro, I was t- I was talking about this earlier this week. And, like, there are a lot of NBA players who I genuinely think, like, y'all got, like, just innately, y'all know how to play basketball. I'm never, ever, ever going to say that I'm better at basketball than y'all. But in terms of analyzing the game, analyzing prospects, like, that is not like there are a lot of people who are very good at it in any sport like there are people that are really good at it in the nfl really great at analyzing draft prospects talking about the game breaking down analysis who may have never played the sport before Mm -hmm. like it requires a lot of research like in doing it and like really honing in on that that part of your craft but just because you are good at playing it does not also make you good at analyzing it same for same reason that some of the best players can't be good coaches like it's a different skill set bro i just watched tim hardaway say that bull bull is better than women yama he's just more nba ready which is like a weird thing to say because he's been in the league forever he should be but whatever bull bull got <laughs> waved by the magic who didn't make the play in tournament that should tell you everything you need to know bro bull bull's a- gotten waved multiple times off of bad teams he said he's had he just has more physical tools. Like, bro, when are we gonna realize that Bull Bull is not good? <laughs> like, when, when are we, are we gonna realize that? Matter of fact, they posted the Bull Bull when he got signed to the Suns. His <laughs> highlight tape was him at a YMCA cooking pe- just me and you. Like, bro, what? Bro, what are we talking about? Anytime people go that hard on Bull Bull, especially after the Wemby stuff, I try and be like. I'm sure, why am I impressed with this? I've seen Bo Bo do this a million times. You are just exposing that you really are not watching basketball like that, bro. Right. You, you're watching highlights. You see the little clips, the oohs and ahs. He had the little whatever month or so run where he was in the rotation in Orlando. It was looking good. The shot was falling. All of a sudden, the shot stopped falling. Oh, my gosh. He's a traffic cone on defense. Can't guard nobody. He can't play. Like, and it's not no knock to him. It's, again, we talked about it. It's hard for these unicorn-type bigs to work out for that reason. Like, you're not big. You can't bang with a lot of the bigger bodies in the NBA. If you're not going to be, like, an elite-level rim protector, the offense has to be really good. Like, Chris Stapp's level good. Because if it's not, it's very hard for you to get consistent minutes. That's what we see with Bowl Bowl. Teams have tried it. Multiple <clears throat> teams now have tried it. He just got cut by a team that is young, like super young, and didn't make the playoffs. And they were like, mm, we can't keep you. We don't have a spot for you here. 
that should tell you enough. All right, but he's about he's to go going to the Suns. He's going to the Suns on a flyer deal. Like, bro, what are we talking about right now? <sighs> I don't know, man. And the Paul Pearson, what he said about Damian Lillard, Damian Lillard goes to Miami. It's not a good team. Like, he said he, that? Did you not see that? Oh, I didn't my see that. Gosh. Let me pull up the full quote. There's he, no was, shot he was he up there. That. He was up there with um with Rachel Nichols and um Tracy McGrady. And he basically was like, if bro, right now, last season, we will, this is the second time we've seen a Jimmy and Bam led Heat team make the NBA finals. Obviously, they did it in the bubble. They did it last year. He said if Damian Lillard joined this Heat team, they wouldn't make it out of the first round in the East. That Bro, can't be the, that Tracy can't McGrady. Be the Tracy McGrady was sitting next to him. He was like, I, literally losing his mind. He's like, Rachel, please talk to this man because like I can't, I can't right now. Who, who, wait, who said this? Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce. But we like this, this, this. All his takes be like this, bro. Like, I said, bro, I do not care if you are a Hall of Fame basketball player. That does not mean you instantly know ball. Like you know how to play it. Yeah, for sure you know how to play it. That does not mean that you're just your 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 process and your takes are just instantly above any of ours who've never played at the highest level. I do not care because that is that that genuinely like the re. What is even the the reasoning for that? He said it's because the reason that they made it to the finals last year was because they had the. You know, Caleb Martin was hooping for them. He was giving, you know, he's giving the Celtics work. Max Struess was hooping. You know, Gabe Vincent, he's not there anymore. So it's like you're gonna get, damn, you gotta give up these pieces. And it's like that's the only reason that they made it that far is because their bench people, you know, their role players was really stepping it up big, which is like true. But it's like if we gotta lose, you know, you lost Struess and Vincent already. If we gotta lose Hero, who didn't play for us to make the finals, right? One and two, give up. Gabe Vincent got to go too, and we're getting back Damian Lillard. <laughs> bro, come like, on, bro. Come about? on, bro. What are we, won't make it out of the first round? Like, come on, bro. It could be they could have gave up Bam and still made it out of the first round. Like, that's not even like a. What are we? What? What are you talking about? I really about? think. I really think some of it is. Bro, it's still got hatred in his heart for the Miami Heat. That is true. That is because a lot of people, bro, and I've noticed this being on Twitter, but a lot of people really just like they, the they cannot separate like the fandom and the like the the the, the fairness and the accuracy. Like they can't, for the life of them, separate that like at all. And it's it, it's tough. It's sad to see. It really is. Yeah, that was NBA crazy. media. Is, NBA like fandom is like. Bro, a lot of NBA fans are so stupid. I'm gonna be honest. A lot of NBA fans are so dumb, bro. It's a, like one of the dumbest fan bases like out there. It has to be delusion. Um, but yeah, T Mac was literally sitting there like, bro, what are you talking about right now? Like you're literally just like, you're just capping. There's no way you really believe this. Doesn't like, even make sense. It's not they, even. They add one of the 75 greatest players to ever play the sport of basketball. In playing his best history. basketball right now. Right, and they 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 can't even get out of the first round. A team that just made the finals can't get out of the first round. <sighs> bro, this dude riding so hard for the Celtics. You're not even the best Celtic ever, bro. You're not even the second best Celtic ever, bro. I'm not hearing, you, bro. I, don't, I never liked Paul Pierce. I'm be honest with you. I just never did. Was he and the then, best Celtic on that uh that no. team? No, it was KG. He won in Finals MVP, but he was not the best Celtic. No, he was not. Hey, I'm not, even, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about like the, the season as a whole, and even that that whole little era, the big three that they had in Boston. KG is better than him, bro. Yeah, it's all time easily. KG, KG is, better, is than better than him. But bro. I think even at that time, KG still giving you twenty a night, face up, post up, had the mid range going, and being the elite defender that he was. KG, it's not even like revisionist history. At the time, I'm feeling the same way as a kid. Like mm -hmm. KG was, Paul Pierce was the the closer, like right. the primary offensive option, but KG was right there in terms of like offensive production when needed. 
Um, obviously not to the same level, but coupling his ability on offense with being the defensive anchor, one of the defensive best defensive players ever. Like he was, he was the guy. He was the guy. Thanks. Uh, and shout out KG because he's one of the the older, you know, retired players who kind of like is AI in the sense that he really just. We don't come out and really hate on nobody. He just showed love. love to the next generation. It, like he did that interview with Chet. He really was just like, bro, you are I see it. I see you taking the leaps on the defensive side of the ball. You out here, you got the instincts, you block it, everything. Mm-hmm. It's a cool moment for him too. It's like Chet's like, bro, where do you think I learned it from? I'm watching your highlights. Mm-hmm. It's like, bro, when you're just good and like, you know, you just enjoy the game, you giving it up, like giving praises to the next generation, like is it going to come back in return? You're going to get your flowers. So you see it with AI because AI is one of the, the biggest proponents of just being like, I had my time. I did what I did. Like, yes, I had influence on the game, but like, it's the young guy's time. Like, he always is showing love to the next generation, which is how it should be. Like, I think mm-hmm. Larry Bird gave a speech recently. He got, like, I think a Lifetime Achievement Award or something. He was, like, talking about how it's a lot of older guys who are – stingy about the you know younger generation of the nba and you know, may not like the way that's going but um he was like bro when you think about some of the young superstars in the league and he listed out a lot of them he was like bro the game is in great hands and like if we give our time back to mentor to help to just even be involved in it like the game is going to continue to grow to heights bigger than it was than we were playing it and that's what we should want like as Retired players, you should want the game to continue to elevate and take itself to new levels. So, bro, do not be no hater like Paul Pierce, bro. <laughs> be a KG, be an AI. Facts. Um, honestly, at this point, I don't even really want to talk about this Joel Embiid thing because this is <laughs> this is people taking a quote and blowing it out of proportion. He was talking to Maverick Carter and he said that. He wants to win a ring. He doesn't know where it's going to be. Is it in Philly? Maybe it won't be in Philly. And teams were like, you know, reporters called when and was like, Joel B, maybe he wants out. Honestly, bro, everybody wants to win a ring. He doesn't know if it's going to be in Philly or not. Only thing I would say is it could be in Philly if you would start playing a little bit better in the playoffs. That is true. <laughs> yeah, like that's literally it. Like I, I'm not going to go in on him just because he didn't say I want out of, out of Philly. But if that day comes... Joel Embiid, we need to have a sit down, my brother, because it's not like they haven't put enough talent around you. That's that was never was the case. Multiple good iterations. You had Jimmy and Ben and JJ, and then we got rid of ben, uh, of Jimmy, and now we got Ben and Tobias. And right, then, and then well, we traded him, and we got right. Harden in. It's like you've had the talent if you just played like the MVP, and maybe 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 stop worrying about the MVP and actually like preserve yourself for the playoffs so you don't keep getting hurt. Maybe you you might have at least had a conference finals. But like, you didn't request a trade, so I'm not going to sit here and act like how could you dare say this when like no, nah, he didn't like he literally just said I might win it here, I might not, which is right. a true thing. He might win it here, he might not. Who knows? Yeah. So, I look, that's all I'm going to give to it cuz I think that is for real just beat writers and the rumor mill got to churn something out on slow news days because this is the the dead dead deadest part of the off season easily um, which is why y'all gotta stay tuned into the podcast because you're about to start coming out with some player rankings going into next season so we got y'all covered in the the slowest part of the off season to still get bring y'all the basketball content but to wrap up today's episode the FIBA World Cup is starting next month. I think it starts August 25th, runs for about two weeks. Um, it's in Asia this year. It's between, uh, it's in Indonesia, Japan, and the Philippines. And we're going to go ahead and draft a roster, um, a 5v5 draft with FIBA Team USA's roster. Again, we're just going to draft, you know, whatever five man lineups um, based on the roster for this year's World Cup. Um, and see who who drafts the better team. I've got it pulled up. You can have the first pick. I'm excited to do this draft because every time I look at this team, like, bro, everybody is so young. This really can be ushering in a new era of, like, USA basketball. Cause I think the Olympics comes up in one year or two years because they did it in 2021. Um, so it's either going to be next year or the year after. And that's probably going to be the last time we see some of, like, the guys that we've seen play for Team USA for years now. Like, Thanks. Um you know, KD and book, like 
probably gonna be the last time they play in like an Olympics, and then like it's really gonna be the change in the guard for this young team to take over and kind of hold the fort down for a decade or so. So uh, I'm excited to see how this team performs in in the, the FIBA World Cup. And honestly, I'm excited to see a lot of these international teams in general. And like I said, when I watched EuroBasket uh, last year, um, you see what Luca's doing with Slovenia. That was when Lori was hooping with the you know the team in Finland, and that kind of led into his year this year, um, kind of taking off into the All Star player that he's become. So I'm excited to see this young team, and I'm excited to see how they compete with some of the more established international teams too. Uh, but further ado, let's get into it. A five v five draft of Team USA's FIBA World Cup roster. You have the first pick. Come on, man. I can't I can't talk about all we talked about with the breakout players and not draft Anthony Edwards with my first mm-hmm. overall pick. So I'll go in. And then you get back to back. We'll do the snake draft again. Okay. So with that, same thing. I'm gonna take one of my breakout players. I'm gonna take Tyrese Halliburton and okay. then I'm gonna double up Tyrese with Mikael Bridges. So got Ooh. me a nice guard. And then I got I think the best defender on the roster as well. Um, so I'm gonna take Tyrese and Mikel Bridges there. Copy, copy, copy. So I got back to back. So I'm gonna go. I gotta go. Hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Where's he at? Why not on my list? Oh no, there he is. Okay, I'm about to say I'm about to go Jalen Brunson. He's gonna run my one for me. Mm-hmm. He's gonna facilitate the offense. And then after that, I'm gonna go Bi. Dang, I was you know hoping I could get Bi. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna go Bi. The only okay. way you was going to get B.I. is if my fandom fanned out and I just picked Austin Reed. That was the only way. Okay. Well, then we're really just about to go for some for real clamps because my next pick, I'm going to go with Triple J. I've seen that defensive coming. player of the year. Oh, my gosh. Pick and roll. Mikel at the point of attack. Jaron in the drop. We're locking everything up. We're locking everything up. Um, and then for my next pick, um... Dang, let me think. I could go super big there. Um, I think it's a mean little drop off at the guard spot. After, oh, D. After Tyrese <laughs> runs in the end. Oh, oh, D. Um, you know what? Bro, give me Austin Reeves, bro. Oh, yeah. You know what? I like that. You won already. You won already. Cause You know what I'm saying? My boy AR-15. About to go stupid. So, you got Tyrese, AR-15, Mikel, Triple J. I got Jalen. I got B.I. I got Ant. So I need a big. Damn. It's, it's, too, it's too up there. Yeah. So, I'm going I'm to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go Walker Kessler. Mm-hmm. I, I got to go Walker Kessler. Now, do I want to go... Hmm. What's my team look like? What's my spacing look like? Jalen B.I. Oh, no, I'm straight. Yeah, give me Walker Kessler and give me Paolo. Dang, I wanted to take Paolo. I'll, I'll do that. Give me Walker Kessler and then give me Paolo. Okay. And I'm you know on the... my team all set. So is it only two people about to get undrafted? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's only 12. <laughs> <laughs> well, my last pick, uh, give me Cam Johnson. I'm going to put Triple J at the five. So then I got Tyrese at the one. I got Austin yeah. Reeves at the two, Mikel at the three, Cam Johnson at the four, and Jaron Jackson Jr. at the five. I got Jalen Brunson at the one, Ant at the two, B.I. at the three, Paolo Bucero at the four, and Walker Kessler at the five. This is tough. I like your defense. Your defense is crazy. Defense is stacked, bro. Your defense Mikel, is crazy. Triple J, even Cam Johnson to an extent. Like, mm-hmm. We here on the defensive side of the ball, like and at the same time, we got people, you know, Mikel Jordan. You know, he on the offensive <laughs> side of the ball, we got Tyrese setting everybody up. AR-15 might be the coldest white man in the NBA right now. So, <laughs> you yeah. see him on the, the All the Smoke podcast, they had to talk about him and Taylor Swift. <laughs> so crazy, bro. I ain't never, bro, I never believed that when it first came. I'm like, bro, there's no way you're telling me Austin hey, Reeves. That's how you know the media is crazy. Started a whole rumor that they were dating. He said, bro, I've never even, have, not that I haven't met her. I've never talked to her in my life. But the, but they're dating, apparently. And all it took, all it took was one second half of the season that was good. Like, that's all it took in a Lakers uniform, bro. I'm not going to lie. I see why people hate the Lakers sometimes because that's, that's so crazy, bro. The media, the hype you get, like even Gabe Vincent right now. 
was on a whole media tour on everybody podcast, getting interviewed mm-hmm. by everybody. It's like, bro, if he just re-signed with Miami, bro, no one would even talk about Gabe Vincent no more. Not to the not to the same extent. Um, yeah, man. It's a lake show, man. Everybody wanna talk about the lake show. That's how that's how it is, man. We're the best. What can I say? We're just the best. How you feel about uh two K cross play this year? Don't care. I'm not buying it. I'm, I'm <laughs> I might, I, maybe I'll buy it if it go on sale, bro. Like, I just, game sucks, bro. The game sucks. Like, bro, I'm really not into these sports games no more. Especially bro. with my, you, you know, my situation coming up, bro. I'm not even going to have time. Bro, and you know, they said, they said, my career is streamlined again. You don't, you don't got to go to the studio and rap with J. Cole this year. You don't got to so, do so no dumb. fashion. You don't got to do the skateboards. Like. I'm Why like, did they even add that in the first place? Bro, I have no idea. If if I get it, I, I'm getting it strictly to play pro am. Like I'll upgrade my player, and I'm only like I'm not even gonna touch the part. I'm only playing pro am. I'll be like one of them dudes that be like rookie one, but it'd be like 99, <laughs> like maxed out player, just plays strictly like comp pro am. That's it. Yeah, it's it's rough. They gotta get the gameplay better, bro. Cause it's even just randomly like I was I was playing with my girl the other days because we was bored. And she was like, why do I feel like I'm moving like weird? I can't I feel like I'm in cement. And I was like, that's crazy. You've never played this game before. And it's like, even you can tell the movement is bad. Like, mm-hmm. I think back to like 2K17. It's like, bro, why is the movement better in a game that's six years old on an older system? Older felt, engine, felt, everything. Dribbling felt better. It felt more fluid. Like. Bro, I always said the downfall of 2K was the fact that they hated dribbling so much and that they basically tried their best to eliminate it. Because, like, that is the most creative and fun part about playing, like, video games or playing 2K. It's like, bro, I, I think about it, even in, like, 2K, like, 19. I think 2K19 had the best dribbling ever. That's That was my opinion. Just because, bro, it was, you could have, like, 10 different styles of dribbling. Yeah. Like, you, like, every... Bro, in like 2K20, all these other 2K, you, everyone dribbles the same. Same exact like, bro, way, yeah. 19, 17, you could dribble completely different. We, me and you could be nice at dribbling. OD, best in the world, and dribble com- two completely different type of ways. Yeah. So it's like the game was always fun. It was never like boring and stale. But. Bro, I miss when, like 2K17 where you could do like, you could work everything off the um, the momentum cross. You could like if you double flick the stick and get the fast cross. You mm-hmm. back, back, hezzy, tween, back, back. Like, so I'm saying, so you could dribble clean. different. And then 2K18 was, we ain't even got to talk about that because that was the snatch back year, right? Where yes. Everybody, yes. Everything was literally just drive, yank, drive, yank. Mass base, green. Easy, bro. Oh, that year sucked. It was 2K20, which, which year was the spin back where everybody was doing spin backs? 20. Yeah, they cooked it. And then last year, uh, 21 and 22 was the same way. Dribbling just kept getting nerfed and nerfed. And they added the – I didn't even play part at all this year. But I've seen people complain that the – was it the adrenaline meter that they added was stupid because it's like – I didn't even notice it when I be playing, like, just playing out online. It's like using somebody that can dribble. Like, even if it's like it's Kyrie. Like, bro, you could do, like – Explosive cross, explosive behind the back. I'm down to one bar. Like, I got one move left, and then it's like I can't do nothing crazy for the rest of the possession. That's what I'm saying, bro. I don't know why they literally every year it's like, let's try to get rid of dribbling. Let's try to get rid of dribbling. Why are you doing that? That's the only fun part about the game is trying to dribble. And it's getting to the point where it's, like, not realistic. Like, have we not seen Kyrie Irving? go crazy on end of like individual possessions like really like tween cross shift somebody shift him again spin off it like but that's how he plays basketball and that's in a real nba game if we talking about in the park bro we see what Kyrie's done in a like an all-star game setting like mm-hmm. bro that's how he plays but it's not unrealistic for him to chain together a whole bunch of crazy dribble moves in a row like Facts. I get it that people exploit it and be doing it to the most and left, right, cheese, back and forth. But, like, oh, we already know what the problem is. They cater to they cater to the casual players. They cater to mm-hmm. people that can't figure out how to stop it. They don't like it. So it's like they got to do something to nerf that. But, like, people that actually got 
stick work. But the left right is not that deep, bro. Nah, it's really not. Okay, hey, man. Game sucks. Game will always suck forever. It will always be trash. Game's horrible. That's I'm a playing shame. video games. We are retired. We're getting too old. Yeah, bro. About I'm to retired. just start. About to just start going to random people's cookouts and playing dominoes and spades. Spades be but oh, hey, spades, spades be busting. My uncle told me how to play spades. spades. You know how to play spades? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we playing when I come up there. Oh yeah, Bro, spades I'm be trying, going crazy. I be wanting to get into like some for real spades games. Like I want all the all the energy, all the trash talk. The same because like when I play dominoes with my family, sometimes like it's cool. It's I like playing dominoes, but it's like it's chill. Like. Nah, I want to get crazy. Like, nah, get boom, slamming it on the mm. table. Like, Hit, I want to yeah, get facts. for real. Um, so I, I want to get into some old heads phase games, some old heads dominoes games. Because A, I'm not losing. But B, <laughs> like, that's like the trash talk is fun. And, you know, I don't play sports like that. I'm not, you know, I'm going to retire. My body all worn down. Like, mm. I need some somewhere to get the, the trash talk energy out. Nah, so, for that. Nah, we're gonna yeah. be we're gonna be up there going crazy. Yeah, and honestly, bro, watching like the quarterback show on Netflix that really made me reminisce. Like, bro, we, you really could say some wild stuff on a football field. Like when I think back on it, it's like yo, we really used to get active, and then after the game, like even with people we knew, like we was cool with them off the field. But as soon as like the whistle blow, you got your helmet on. It's like. But we are not friends right now. I literally would take your head off if I could. <laughs> the worst, the the worst trash talk was against like, um, was against people that you knew, or like, like that we right. went to school with. But like they played for the like when they played for Cross, like the other rival team. Yep. You got it the worst, cause like nah, I'm gonna kill you out right. here. Like you're like it's no friends. I'm trying to kill you. Then literally as soon as it the clock strikes zero. Good game, bro. <laughs> like, like, good game. Bro, and then we'll talk bro, about it afterwards. Right. Go get some food after. Like, bro, what you doing? Right. Try to get on the game later? Like, right. Even though I just tried to take your head off two seconds ago. I literally just literally, tried to kill you. I'd but. never I'll never forget the play. But we, for real, was on, we was on like the 10 or 5-yard line. It was close. And Jason was playing safety. Mm. He was saying something to us after the play before. And me and Alvin look at each other like, bro, what is he talking about, bro? And he was like, he was like, I'm coming. Like, let us know he was blitzing. He walking up on the line. We're like, bro, you're not, you're not <laughs> getting packed. Bro, you are like 180 pounds. You're not about to get through me and Alvin, bro. Run into the line. Boom. Like, we stole. I think we scored on the play. And I was like, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. bro, I missed that. I missed that. Like, watching the show and, like, seeing Mahomes, like, how he be really, he be, he kind of be yapping. He, he a little bit corny. But, uh I like the fact that it just showed more personality, bro, because I, I watched, I don't know if you've seen Patrick Mahomes in the interview when he did it on uh, Travis Kelsey podcast, like mm -hmm. during, it was like during the season. Um, I watched that whole podcast. And I'm just like, bro, can, like, mind you, I'm like, this is like one of his best friends. This is Travis Kelsey. This is Jason Kelsey. Like, you know, they show personality. Like, yeah. I'm like, bro, can he break character? Like, this guy is so like. <laughs> like he's so like he got, he got the media answers down pat that's what i'm like bro you were on a podcast with like one of your best friends break character that's why i like the, the quarterback show because like I, you see him like really show emotion like bro right. the time where and i this is how you know like like media and stuff really be getting to people sometimes bro when they played the Bengals the third time like the regular season one when they lost he was mm -hmm. like yeah you know i haven't beat them guys like you know i really want to beat them whatever whatever and then when they lost Bro, as soon as he walked off the, the the field, they had the cameras on. Like he was like fine or whatever. As yeah. soon as bro turned the corner and the cameras was off, you just heard, fuck. Like yo, bro, you heard him squeak. I'm like, that's how you know. Like he really, he he knows the thing. I'm like, oh yeah, I've never beat Burrow's. Right. Like he was saying, Burrow like, yeah, Burrow head. Like that really, bro. When you're a competitor, bro, that really pissed people off. Hundred percent. That was yeah. the first time I really seen like emotion. Like, and I like seeing stuff like that. I'm tired of seeing them do be a robot, bro. Like right. he went, when he who it was he got a Max Crosby face right now. Yeah, he was like you woke you woke the wrong one up. You woke right. the wrong one up in his face mask. Like that's the type of intensity that's like, bro. As an old lineman, nah, I'm I'm juice now. We can go. <laughs> we can get ready to go. Yeah, I, look, I'm. They need to get announced now who they got going for for season two because I really bro. like the way they have it set up with like. One of the best quarterbacks in the league, like a fringe, 
Like, really good Average. guy, guy who could could potentially make that leap. And then just give me somebody. I don't got it. I could be a rookie. I need to be, be a like, rookie, though. I, I didn't, I'm saying, I didn't like the Mario the one, though. Like, Mario sucks. Like, he, like, like, bro, they got somebody who they knew was going to lose their job halfway through the season. Like, that's, and that's, I feel bad for him because, like, bro, you stink. And you, and they know he stunk. Like, don't get, I'd rather you get a rookie because the rookie's going to stink, but, like, at least you have potential. Like, you're going to get somebody right. who, like, Bro, after the season, he's going to be a backup. Like, why would you get this guy? I would like to see, like, to replace, like, Mariota's spot. Bro, put Jimmy G up there. I would like to see Jimmy It'd be Garoppolo. interesting in Vegas, yeah. Right, because that's what I feel like. It's somebody who, like, Mariota came in. They draft Ritter. It's like he would really have to perform. And he was for a little bit, and then it kind of, you know, the wheels fell off. It's like mm-hmm. same thing with Jimmy G. It's like young. You know, like trains over, they get rid of Derek Carr. You come in, you kind of like a bridge guy, even though, like, you were one of those, you won all the time in San Francisco. Obviously, a lot of that was on the defense's back. But at the end of the day, I think Kirk Cousins mentioned it. They did some, like, separate interview, and he was like, he think Jimmy Garoppolo is super underrated because it's like, right at the end of the day, winning is hard to do in the NFL, and he won a lot in San Francisco. You think about how he played or whatever is what it is at the end of the day he won the games and that's like you're attributing win loss to the qb he won a lot more than he lost got them to the super bowl got them to multiple nfc championship games like he clearly is a winner if nothing else we'll see mm-hmm. how much that holds up without having kyle shanahan offense and you know the 49ers crazy defense there in las vegas but i'd like to see him up close because i would want to at least get into his mentality of like I think he knows they're bringing him in as a bridge guy, but like obviously you would want to be a franchise guy. So like, bro, what if he hoop next year? Devonte Adams go crazy. I, I don't know what the situation is gonna be with Josh Jacobs, but like they can sort that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like they can <clears throat> sort that out. I want to see Jimmy G and then like Josh Allen and like Jalen Hurts, like one you know of the top do? guys. You know what they should do? Because they normally have, I think they have, like, I don't know if they'll have two elite guys. They'll have, like, a elite, elite guy, and then they'll have, like, Kirk Cousins is, like, 10-ish to 12. Right, he's, like, on the outside guy. looking in, yeah. They should get, like, they should get, like, Jalen Hurts, mm-hmm. like, coming off a Super Bowl loss. Now you got this stacked team, and, like, I don't know, I feel like his his, his would be cold. She should get Jalen Hurts, and they should get Geno Smith. I feel like Gino, Gino Smith, Smith as a mid be a guy, one too, yeah. Like, cause they got a had coming off a good year. You know, you had your bounce back, your little late late career resurgence. You know, what I mean, y'all got a good team. Like, mm-hmm. it's gonna be like the the Vikings. Like, y'all got a good team. Like, y'all gonna win some games. Like, y'all gonna make the playoffs probably. I feel like that'll be a good one. Yeah, I don't know if they get a hold of him though. You know, he don't write back. So, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I like I like Gino a lot too. I think that'd be a good one. They just need to hurry up and announce it, cause. Bro, that show was gas. Like, I binged it in, like, two days. I just finished it yesterday, bro. It was, bro. Amazing gas, show, bro. bro. Amazing show. Are they, do they announce it or do they, like, at, during the season or before the season or do they just I don't wait think they, after? I don't think they did for this one. I think they announced it after, but that's because it was, it was, it didn't have as much buzz because anybody's seen it yet. But now that it's, like, it came out, one of the top shows on Netflix, <laughs> they're going to have to announce it sooner. Um, yeah, I hope so. They should do every so. year. They should do, like they should keep the series going. Like that. Right. Is, is and I think, I think it's the perfect format, right? You keep an elite guy, fringe good guy, and then like a rookie or bridge QB type of guy, so that you always see the different parallels of the NFL, mm-hmm. um, how they season progresses. But I mean, bro, looking out and you pick Mahomes in a year that he wins the Super Bowl, you get all the behind the scenes coverage. Like, they picked. They picked amazingly with him and Kirk because. Those yeah. he was in he was in the greatest comeback in NFL history and he was in that Bills game which was crazy like bro yeah. that that just gave me chills bro I went and rewatched the highlights of that Bills game bro that just gave me chills Jettis is the best receiver of all time bro and I'm not even saying this from a biased perspective because he was on my fantasy team and carried the just win Jeffersons to a back to back championship <laughs> but bro is that not the greatest catch in NFL history it's up there. Just, it's up there moment up there what is better than it i mean i just think the like yeah <laughs> i mean odell's catch is crazy bro he caught it with one hand like turned around like this with the the db is catching at the same like, it could really have gone either way 
and it was fourth down. Like they, it was like had, fourth and eighteen. They had to have this. Literally, Kirk was like, "All right, Jettas, let me see it. I <laughs> just do it up there." No, he it's, grabbed it's, it with one hand. It's de- it's definitely a conversation of the best catch ever because it, it's watching it back. It just doesn't make sense because the, the DB had two hands on the ball. Like he caught it. Like the DB caught it for him basically, and he just nah, like snagged right. it from him. Like it, it was it was crazy, bro. Jettas is. Well, all I know is I better had a one on one in our fantasy draft because I need Jettas on my team in some fantasy league that I put money in. I need him on my team, bro. I'm so sorry. I you gotta think, have. You think Jettas is confirmed the number one receiver in football? Yeah, right now. Who oh, you talking you about like in, re- in real life? No, or real fantasy? life. Oh, um, I think he. I think yeah, just because if Devontae Adams still had Derek Carr. Like I think he'll, I think Devontae Adams will take a little bit of a step back in production just because Jimmy G don't throw the ball downfield. Like Derek Carr, love him or hate him, bro, he gonna launch it. Like he gonna throw it downfield. So like, like bro, I mean you seen it, you had him on your team too. Devontae Adams, it was playing times, but bro was just down the field. Three receptions, a hundred and twenty yards. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So like he gonna launch it. So yeah. I don't know. I just think right now. <sighs> I, I got according Jettis to on. Madden, is Jettas is the only ninety nine, and they got Tyreek number two out of ninety eight. I mean, yeah, I, Jettas he deserves it. I I think it, it, it's just hard to say he's not the best receiver in football because it's like, what more could you want this guy to do? He put up like eight, what eighteen hundred yards. Like, how is he not like? If I put up eighteen hundred yards and you're saying, no, nah, this guy's better than me, you're smoking. Like, just no shot. He just he he's a receiver that legitimately he's a rare breed of like. He doesn't have the genetic deficiency. It's like he's got the size. He's got the length. Cool. He's got the athleticism. Hands are ridiculous. So he can do everything you want out of any jump ball X receiver while at the same time being one of the best route runners in the NFL Mm -hmm. and is so versatile that you can utilize him in motion like Cooper Cup. Yeah. He has everything. Literally, what can't he do? Like the ultimate receiving weapon in the NFL. I just think his numbers are going to be better than Tay's, but if if someone said Tay was the best receiver in the league still, I would not be, like, I would I still think shocked. Devontae Adams is the best route runner. Like, bro, when I watch oh, yeah, him run routes, sure. even on air, one-on-one, in a game, it's like, bro, how do you guard this? Like, it's he, too shifty. He's the best route runner in the league because he makes DBs look stupid. Like, I legitimately watch him break people's ankles. And it's like, it'd be, bro, he cooked Pat. Pat Sertan for a game winning, like, he ran, ran like a post corner. Cooked him and, like, bad. Cooked him. Like, bro, was still running to the opposite hash. Like, bro, now he hit his release off the line and his just route running. He could run the whole tree. Tay's definitely the best route runner in the league, for sure. I just think Jetta's numbers is going to put him to the point where, like, he has to be said, has to say he's the best right now because he has all that and he's putting up 1,800 yards. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's crazy, bro. If if nothing else, that quarterback show has turned me into a Kirk Cousins fan, which I don't think I could have ever said because I mm-hmm. used to be almost at times a Kirk Cousins hater because people would put him and Dak in the same thing. I was like, bro, Dak got to hey, be man. better than Kirk. I don't know, man. Look, I can't defend Dak after last year, so we're going <laughs> we're gonna to leave that be. I need to see something from Dak this year. But Kirk, watching him this last season getting the – you know, the behind the scenes with the quarterback and really seeing week in, week out the rib injuries. He's got the big, you know, rib cage on the pads and he getting lit. Uh, I remember watching that Cowboys game and it was like, bro, every time he drops back, he's either getting sacked or even if he gets it off, he's getting smoked every mm-hmm. play. He just keep getting up. I didn't realize how, how much he got hit last year, bro. He bro, was and hearing shots. him on the mic, like, you're like, ah. Like, bro, <laughs> he sounded like he got shot. Like, he is mm-hmm. in pain, bro. So, hey, bro. yeah. He, I got a newfound respect for, for Captain Kirk, for sure. 100%. Uh, but, yeah, man, look, we're going to get into the, the NFL as the season gets closer. Um, we're definitely going to have to get some NFL episodes here. We're going to branch out a little bit from just the basketball because – the quarterback show, bro, sparked it. I'm like, bro, I can't wait for the NFL season. Like, even forget wait, fantasy bro. football because I'm about to go on a three-peat. That's nothing. No, you're not, bro. Yes, I am, no, bro. No, you're not, bro. bro this is what you're not this winning. Is, 
You're not winning. Bro, you're not winning. Bro, I'm over my dead body, bro. I'm not letting it happen, bro. This is what y'all said last year. Now we was playing from last. The first year was whatever, bro. First this year was a six-team league. league. It was some okay. little. Like, we didn't even bro, play fantasy. We, we, second year, we put bread on the line. We got the, the full league, 10-team league. I blame bro. Stackers. Nah, bro. Y'all let. Bro, any Stackers fall? I had Jettas and Tay. And, and I, bro, honestly, real talk. They folded. They, bro, whoever was in the middle between, like, Stackers, Alvin, and all in the middle. And my, he was, I know, he folded too. Started with, like, three running backs. I'm like, bro, yeah. you're so, ugh, that was so gross, bro. It was so gross. Now, we, I'm locked, though. I'm locked. I can't, bro. Cannot wait for football. Oh, my God. Well, we got to get, we got to get the draft situated. We got to get the draft I could up. do, I could do most of it all today. Um, okay. But we really just had to find one more person in each league. That's really all we gotta do is find one person. If you are off the glass subscriber, and <laughs> into a comp fantasy football league, hit the DM on the account, drop a comment, bro. Let us know because we need one. And if we could find three more, make it a twelve team league. I'm down for that too. I love, so I can bro. take more of y'all, bro. Get out of here, bro. I do want a twelve team league. I just don't think we have enough people. I would love a twelve team league though. Bro, I am still down for a 32-man league. Nah, you're crazy. You lost me. <laughs> you lost me. I'm telling I'm you right now, bro. All I need, bro, give me who the most bare-bones quarterback I could think of right now. Bro, bro you, give, give me Will Levis. Bro, we putting a team together. We winning a championship, bro. Bro, 32-team league. You will have first pick dude will have Jay Jettas, and their next pick will be Austin Hooper. Like, it would not. It would be terrible. Bro, but when when Jet is boom, that's he would he would carry the whole team. But them scores be like, and like I've watched, I've seen a couple like scores. It'd be like thirty to like twenty. <laughs> It'd be bad. injuries would be crazy. Could you imagine your first like you got the second overall pick? You pick like Saquon or I don't know whoever like some big running like back Caffrey or something. Yeah, they get hurt like week one. Your season over. You're, You're done. You it's, might as well just so, donate the money. You just donate it, bro. The Thanks. waivers is literally like people that's on the for real NFL waivers. I'd <laughs> 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 pick by pick up Larry Fitzgerald, right. Drew Brees, like um, Rivers, yeah, bro. But yeah, we gotta get the fantasy situated. I'm dead serious, bro. If you are listen, if you making it hmm. this far in the podcast, obviously, first of all, we appreciate you. But if you're trying to get into fantasy football. Or fantasy basketball, because I would be down to get really into that, like, for real, for real. Because I know when we kind of did it, it flopped. Yeah, it but flopped bad. you down for some fantasy football, fantasy basketball, drop a comment. Go ahead and, and, and leave a comment on <clears> one <throat> of the, the social pages as well. Yeah, if you made it this far, we appreciate you. Be sure to leave a like if you're on YouTube, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you are on audio platforms, drop a five-star uh, rating. Go ahead and leave a review. If you're on the audio platform, go over to the YouTube and leave a like. If you're on the YouTube, go over to the audio platform and leave a five-star rating and review. We appreciate the support as always. Again, because of y'all's support, it's possible that we are able to get this first Seat Geek sponsorship. And that's just the beginning. I promise you that's just the beginning. We're going to keep growing the, the Off the Glass podcast in the community. So we appreciate all support as always. Um, I think our next episode, we're going to get into the, the player rankings, probably starting with the the top 10 point guards looking into next season. So you do not want to miss that. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And as always, I'm Billy Dasdain, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.